officially formally start. Thank you, Cecilia. With this recording in progress, we formally start this ad hoc expert meeting. We have a very, very dense program. Um, we have uh, 20 fantastic experts from all time zones and backgrounds. Um, so we really want to pick their brain. I will then start sharing my screen to see how, how we can introduce this and give some background information. So this is the background. So I will speak right now to the PowerPoint. I hope you can all see the shared screen. It's a, an ad hoc expert meeting on the maritime supply chain. As a background, this type of ad hoc expert meeting is not meant for you, the participants. It is meant for us in UNCTAD. In the UNCTAD work program, we have this mechanism where we in UNCTAD may well need to learn something. Yeah? And for this, we have in our work program the option to invite experts to share their knowledge, experience, opinions with us. Very often, these ad hoc expert meetings are not public. But because we thought this topic is really very interesting, very topical, and because this Zoom format makes it possible to share. So we thought, let's have the raw input, the unfiltered thinking of the experts publicly, whoever registered, can also listen in and benefit from it. But as I said, the main purpose is, is for us. So also the format is a little bit based on this, that we want to learn from the experts. The experts will share their views verbally during this meeting. They will also, to the extent they find the time and have resources, send us additional background material so that we can answer the following two questions. First, what can policymakers do to help reduce freight rates and the burden of excessive freight rates on vulnerable economies and small players across the maritime supply chain and improve connectivity in the short term? What are the long-term policy options to enhance the resilience of the maritime supply chain, including a view of longer-term industry developments, such as the energy transition? I will need to ask the, the panelists as much as possible, keep yourself muted. Um, so the agenda today, I will start my introduction of 15 minutes now. Then we have 20 experts to tell us what can policymakers do, if anything? So if you calculate 100 minutes divided by 20, that's five minutes per expert. And everybody promised me to stick to three to five minutes so that afterwards we have time for discussion. And discussion is really then, what can we in ANCTA do to help our member states? What can we do to help the port authority, the competition authority, the maritime authority, the trade ministry? No? And finally, um, we will have a summary and key takeaways. Our colleague Felicity London, a specialized maritime journalist, will help us with this summarizing and also afterwards with the report writing. So let me start with a substantive introduction, some very basic thoughts about determinants of freight rates, changes of freight rates over time, and an outlook. Determinants of, of freight rates. Um, we had a special section on this in our review of maritime transport 2015 there you can read more details different determinants at a moment in time over time the way i like to present this is to group it into six key determinants they are here i go through them number one distance now here we have a cloud of dots with distances on the x axis and a freight rate on the y-axis. And it's really a cloud of dots. Distance does not explain too much of a freight rate. This is a study we did some time ago in the Caribbean, but overall it is confirmed. Yes, distance matters. It matters more if the fuel price is high than when the fuel price is low. But overall, it just explains 20.58%. You see the R squared of the variance in this study. 
There are other aspects, economies of scale. Let's go beyond containers. Let's look at bulk ships. Here you see the blue line, it's smaller, the handy max. The cost per ton mile is higher on a smaller ship, generally, not always, than on the Cape size, which is a far bigger ship. Uh, then you have imbalances. That's a major worry concern from the shipping lines perspective. And here uh, we are really happy that in our review of maritime transport, we have a new data set from Tim Consult and Bjorn is joining us from, from the company that kindly provided this data. Just by way of example, from Asia to Africa, this long-term freight rate on contract rates $1,946 from Africa to Asia, only 758. Why is that? Well, because the ships and containers have to go back empty anyhow. Type and value of goods. Yes, there is a different price elasticity, different types of commodities. Uh, obviously, reefer costs more than dry and so on and so forth, but just also the type of, if you transport gold, you are willing to pay more. So we also found an elasticity here. Competition. If I take the same earlier study we did on the Caribbean, where you may remember that distance explained only 20% of the variance. If I put on the x-axis instead of distance, the number of carriers providing direct services, then the correlation, this statistically explains 43% of the variance. And of course, there's other causalities, but uh, competition has been shown does help to reduce prices. And then there are port characters. This is where policymakers can do something. So we put all the other variables in different econometric models uh, and found, yes, better port infrastructure reduces maritime transport cost. Better perceived port efficiency reduces maritime transport cost. Port privatization, like concessions, not selling ports, but concessions in the exporting country empirically reduces maritime transport cost. Trade facilitation in the importing country reduces maritime transport costs. Better connectivity, choices, options, different ways to measure this, it does reduce maritime transport costs. So it, for some of these, you may actually have a trade-off. You do either go for economic scale or for more choice. And in our latest review, we included this chart from MDS Transmodal. Antonella is with us. Thank you for the raw data. So if I want to deploy it, 1 million TEU to a country, I can do it either with big ships and few companies or with smaller ships further to the right, but more companies. And here, uh, this is done in the chapter three of our review with uh, Frieda and, and here Noble. By the way, I forgot to mention today's Frieda's birthday. Um, so later on when she speaks, we can sing a song for Frieda. So this is our transport team looking at determinants of Freight because what helps to reduce transport costs? So along the lines of what I just shared, economy of scale, like bigger economies, economies pay less for the transport, quality of port infrastructure helps reduce freight costs, trade facilitation help reduce freight rates, and direct shipping connections help reduce freight rates. So these are six key determinants, very basic. It's not really the main theme of, of this meeting, but I really wanted to share this very basic introduction to be on the same starting point when we discuss what explains differences in maritime transport cost. What we really now want to look at is this one, changes over time and it went through the roof. What happened with these freight rates? And my way, okay, I'm an economist, I like to look at this as very, very basic demand supply, uh, supply curve, starts being very, very steep to the right if you read capacity limits. And the demand curve actually is even steeper in reality, at least in the short term, because if you really need this gadget for Christmas or you need this input for a production, you pay whatever it takes. So what have we seen? We have seen a shift of both curves. We have seen demand curve going to the right, at least for certain goods, there are stimulus packages and so on. And because of slower handling and congestion, other reasons, the supply curve going to the left and the freight rate went through the roof. 
there are different opinions on which point is more important for which commodity, for which trade, for you want to start a blame game, but overall on the demand side, e-commerce stimulus packages led to more demand than we expected at the beginning of the crisis and the supply side, handling imports and the internet did slow down. The main routes changed at the beginning, carriers did skip port calls still today, there were blank sailings, box were left behind. Um, this is something we will certainly discuss over the next couple of hours. And it is a reality that carriers benefit from high freight rates, at least to the extent that profits are high. And there's a discussion about how oligopolistic is the market. I don't want to prejudge any conclusions here, but this is uh, what is being discussed. So in terms of an outlook, I see six reasons why freight rates are likely to remain higher over the next decade than over the previous decade. There's COVID-19, and I'm stealing here a slide from Chai Shan, Dr. Chai Zuk, who is also with us from the Thai uh, Shippers Council, who very nicely explained this in one of our webinars. COVID is still not over. But there's more. There's the longer term shipping cycle where currently the order book is actually quite low compared to previous couple of decades. And if I were to do this chart, not in, don in tons, but in percent of the fleet, it would look even more extreme, even lower now. So ships take two, three years to, to build. So it takes time to come up with the capacity. Then yes, there is this consolidation. You see two sides of the same coin. The uh, ships get bigger. Trade is also growing, but not as much as ships have gotten bigger. Mathematically, something has to give. We have fewer companies per country providing services. Uh, we have had Hanjins going bankrupt. We have had mergers. So com carriers are today in a stronger negotiating position than they were 20 years ago. Is this the reason for this extreme high freight rate right now? I personally don't think so because we have seen other shipping markets like I'm sharing here with you the Baltic Dry Index, LNG, oil, which do not have alliances, do not have the same market structure. Uh, and still there too, if you need 20 ships, but you only have 19 and you have seen the demand supply curve thing, things easily go through the roof. In the longer term, there will be decarbonization. And I know we have Casper uh, with us from the Global Maritime Forum and other colleagues. I just want to reiterate, we support decarbonization. We are in favor of decarbonizing shipping. There's no way around it. But we want to be realistic. This does have some implications on additional costs. And at least in the short term, our assessment we did for the IMO also shows ships will go slower than they would otherwise go. You know, the easiest way to reduce emissions is going slower. And if we go all of us 10% slower, we need 10% more ships. Will these ships build in an uncertain environment? We don't quite know yet what energy we should invest in, what is the regulatory framework at the IMO in London. And then there's the risk premium, if we have more volatility, the, the provider may require higher risk premium and the investor, if there's more volatility and the client at the current situation, we have seen shippers just, it's not just the price, huh? there's a shortage of available capacity. So shippers are willing to pay more. So there's some sort of risk premium. All this is bad news uh, for prices, for example, this data is among the data most quoted in the press of our review of maritime transport. Um, um, we, really, we had uh, Financial Times, Bloomberg, everybody like the impact on consumer prices of the under certain assumptions, uh, plus 1.5 percent for SITS, and I hope you don't mind our acronyms. This is small island developing states, five times stronger this impact. And if you look at different product types, different countries. I find this also particularly interesting. Uh, thank you, Hidenovo, for those simulations, calculations. Um, 
There are two types of products that are particularly impacted. One are lower value goods. You have here like furniture or we have rubber plastic products where a high freight rate quite quickly has, has a high share of the final price. But there are also other products which are very high value. And you would think even if a container costs 20,000 to go from Shanghai to Los Angeles, uh, that doesn't matter for all the iPhones that are inside the container. That's correct. But to produce that smartphone inside the container, many of the bits and pieces had to be moved beforehand. So actually there's a lot of transport inside the final price. And in the longer term, also hope to discuss a little bit, coming back to the energy transition in the process of decarbonizing shipping, maritime transport costs will increase, new technology, new ships, maybe a carbon price, average shipping speeds will decrease. We don't know by how much or for how long. And as a result, maritime logistics costs will go up. So question, what can we do about it? What can policymakers do about it? And here we have uh, our fantastic list of experts. Um, we have tried to group them somehow by groups of interest, but everybody is free to speak about everything. Um, within the group, then it's more or less alphabetically. We have perspective from Africa, from Asia, from Latin America. We have the shippers, the industry. Um, so the idea is really that we, again, here are the, the questions we would like you, the dear experts, and, and really thank you very much for joining to help us answer. And I will then start with Agile. I will do stop share and will directly jump into the conversation and give the floor to Agile, please. So your three minutes of fame. And I will mute my microphone then. Thank you, Jan. Can you get me? Yes, we can hear you. Thanks. Okay, good. Thank you. Um, thank you very much, Jan. And uh, before starting, I would like to thank Untat for, for this uh, privilege. And I will especially thank you, Jan, uh, for this opportunity to talk on the supply chain crisis follow, following the high level panel we got this morning on the presentation of uh, the review of maritime transport. The report clearly outlines the dramatic increase in shipping freight rates that grew four to five times higher since last year, despite the decline observed for some months now. A surge has also been observed in surcharges and fees. The phenomenon was exacerbated with container shortage as a result of many unpredictable schedules and port calls cancellations, known as blank sailings, to many African ports, including Cameroon. So uh, many African countries, including Cameroon, uh, have most more been affected by uh, uh, by blank sailings. Uh, there were some congestion, but. What was the most major impact was uh, blank sailing. One of the main reasons that can explain this situation was uh, the reconfiguration of the shipping on east-west routes. Given the high share of uh, logistics in final goods prices, global consumer price level has increased by an additional 1.5 uh, in developing countries and 7.5 in uh, small island developing countries as pointed out by the report. So if nothing is done to, re to reverse the trend, the risks in terms of inflation and food security can grow very, very high. And uh, what is curious uh, in the meantime is, uh, is the growth in the shipping industry because we can see that uh, the, the operating profits of uh, the shipping lines have doubled uh, in the three quarters of 2021 compared to the entire 2010-2020 period. Shipping lines are said to be using the excess cash from profits and debts repayment, mergers and acquisitions, 
uh, the purchase of vessels and equipment and further investment in terminal assets. So the question, how long is it going to last? How long will the shippers suffer from this unprecedented skyrocketing freight rates higher than those observed after the financial crisis in 2010, 2011? By the end of last year, a return to normalcy was expected to meet July. And now the world economy remains uncertain as to when this return to normalcy will happen. From a competition perspective, uh, it's necessary to lay down a concerted approach through a frank public-private dialogue, whereby government, shipping lines, and trade stakeholders should come together to monitor settings of freight rates to better address or avoid future crises. It should be taken into account in this perspective, the challenges uh, the industry, the maritime industry is going to face in the future, namely autonomous and giant ships, decarbonization, just to name a few. This framework that can be regional or global may involve uh, member state representatives, shipping lines, and any other stakeholders. And I think uh, the steps taken today with contact, maybe it can be the ground. Policymakers uh, can also keep high on their agenda uh, a deep implementation of trade facilitation measures to ease the flow of cargoes at borders and streamline foreign trade procedures through single window pre arrival processing of goods, trade information portals, optimal risk management and clearance of goods. This is what many uh, African countries are engaged into and uh, the process is moving progressively. Uh, if, when possible, government should also support shippers by laying down soft rules for customs valuations. In Cameroon, for instance, uh, for, the post, for the purpose of custom valuation, the Minister of Finance has lowered the transport costs by 80% to avoid bankrupt and inflation. There were already many uh, shippers that were uh, facing some financial constraint. And these measures, these measures aims to support them and ease the removal of uh, the clearance of cargo from ports. Much more can still be done. And we believe that uh, in the era of EFCFTA, African governments can invest in the establishment of a regional shipping line that will contribute to enhance the connectivity of the continent and help to mitigate the potential effects of a future crisis. Uh, there are some shippers, but I don't think that's the case of Africa now, some shippers who have engaged in chartering with shippers own containers, but the cost of uh, shippers own containers for a 20 equivalent unit is 3,500. I think this is still uh, very expensive for African shippers. So I think we really need to have an holistic approach, a concerted approach to look at, at this um, uh, crisis, at this uh, crisis issue uh, for a better future of, uh, uh, of the shippers on the continents, African continents. Thank you, Jean. Thank you, Ajay, very much. Uh, focus on, on trade station solutions, on regional solutions. Not everybody in the room may know all the acronyms. You mentioned the AFCFTA, that's the African Continental Free Trade Area, which really aims at enhancing intra-regional trade in goods, but also intra-regional trade in, for example, transport services. Excellent. Thanks. On, uh, next on my list is Shai Shan, uh, who one of his slides you have already seen in my presentation. We, you were with us at a, a, a webinar recently about this topic. What can we, what can policymakers do? Shai Shan, yeah. you have Yeah, thank you very much, Antat, and thank you, Jane, for, for your kind invitation to uh, me tonight. So uh, due to the time constraint, just only three minutes. So I need to hit the point for the short-term solution. Uh, so uh, this is, uh, I think the flat cost and the container circulation is a very critical issue at the moment. And from now, we have to set uh, the strategic action from today 
and need the cooperation uh, all of the related party in the supply chain. So the key issue, I have to focus in the uh, container circulation and the transit time and uh, how to improve the, uh, the container circulation and the transit time. I do propose for the short term in the three uh, strategic actions. For the first one, all the port, all the international port shall be improve their port uh, productivities and the efficiency in order not only in the port and also other uh, land site, including the truck and to the movement, the container in and out, the container yard, in order to reduce the transit time and make the container flow have a more uh, free flow for the containers. And once the container is cleared out uh, easily and, and the accessibility is very easy at the port in and out. So the second uh, strategic action, so we have to get the collaboration between the exporter, the shippers and the shipping liner in order to have a well uh, planning and uh, scheduling in order to make the proper uh, forecasting of the container requirement in each uh, port or in each destination. Once the, the forecasting, uh, we need, uh, we know it uh, by, might be by the, uh, the service contract from now uh, and the next year, 2022, and the service contract will mention and then the shipping liner and the shipper have a well collaboration. And the third one, so last but not least for the strategic action in the short term, we have to make the information flow in order to understand the, the con uh, congestion in which port and the container uh, circulation, how many percent improvement. So the key tangible action from now, the uh, ANCAT might be others, shall, shall keep focusing in the uh, percentage of the container circulation and the transit time. So this is a key tangible uh, re, uh, monitoring. This is for the short term. For the long term, so let me uh, touch for the long term in order to make the sustainable for the future. Uh, we, we have to set the uh, uh, regulatory enforcement by uh, setting up the fair trade uh, committee the Fair Trade Committee might be uh, do the uh, law and responsibility look similar to the FMC in US. And you might get uh, the procedure and the, con uh, the structure like uh, IMO, International Marine Time Organization. Because IMO at the moment, they keep focusing just only technical safety and environment. They do not touch anything about the commercial term. So that's why if we setting something like the IMO, but keep focusing just only the market, uh, the commercial term. So I think uh, it will be help. So that's why I call might be, it's called the global marine time organization, something like that. It is a very uh, similar uh, organization like the IMO and keep focusing just only uh, uh, commercial term. So uh, the law and responsibility of the, the fair trade uh, commission shall be delegated to and share the information to the nation, the trade competition committee in each country, in each the ANCAT uh, uh, members 195. And then the, once the information know about the trade cost movement in and out, so everything it will be solved. I think that is a framework for our proposal from Thailand. Thank you very much, Jen. Thank you very much, uh, Shai Shan. Uh, um, also a, a reminder to, to all the experts, panelists, um, and also other participants, uh, feel free also to share if you have additional background, which we cannot squeeze in these three to five minutes. Um, we, are, we have already received quite some inputs, background documents, ideas. So if, um, if there are more ideas than fit in those five minutes, send it to us also by email. Then we have next uh, James Hokam from the Global Shippers Forum. James, what can we do to solve the crisis? 
So thank you, Jan. Hello again to everybody. So this is messages that we would be directing to policymakers. Um, and I offer you these three thoughts. Uh, based on the inquiries that uh, we've received, and indeed my member associations around the world have received from their respective governments as, as this crisis evolved. Uh, number one, connect the dots. Uh, looking at the longer term uh, needs of uh, all of us in this industry and lo the logistics industry generally, we need to get governments to think about and update their perspectives on uh, the movement of goods around the world. National transport policy is still developed and administered um, and delivered in narrow modal silos. If this crisis has demonstrated anything, it is the dependency of the different modes on each other and how uh, as the um, peak of demand and uh, flow moved through the supply chains, uh, we moved from a shortage of capacity at sea to a shortage of capacity in the ports and then to a shortage of capacity on inland transport. And governments need to think about the dependency of their economies uh, their import and export economies uh, in those lines rather than seeking to um, address issues solely in narrow modal terms. So even the European Union doesn't do this. Um, so it's not as if it's not as if anyone's starting with a particularly advanced position. Um, but recognizing the uh, interdependencies of the different modes and the way they connect together, I think would be a major learning for policymakers from from these past few months. And likewise, having done that, um, we need governments, policymakers, to be stay close to the market, to understand it better, um, to stay on top of developments. As your analysis showed, Jan, this is this problem. These issues are not going to go away uh, anytime soon. Um, and I know that a lot of time has been spent by uh, national shippers councils, and I'm sure by other industry representatives on this call, in simply walking policymakers through the basics, getting them to understand why we're in the situation we are. Having scaled that learning curve, my second ask of them would be to stay on top of the job um, and continue to follow developments closely. We don't want to keep having to go back to Logistics 101 uh, for national policymakers. Um, my third point, perhaps rather predictably, I'm gonna talk about collaboration. Uh, and I've mentioned this point before in previous uh, statements, um, but again, we, we need to see a greater degree of interactivity between um, uh, the, the different parties and supply chains, uh, and that includes government as well. Um, and that needs to address the inherent suspicion and mistrust that is in, in the industry. Um, and therefore, we still believe that key to unlocking a greater degree of collaboration would be to rethink the antitrust immunity provisions in the market, um, which we consider to be a cloud hanging over the industry. Uh, and which is which is um, uh, hindering progress on this this all important aspect. So three points, hopefully in three minutes, Jan. I hope that's what you wanted. Thank you very very much, James. And in fact, my next speaker should be Sean, but I don't see him as yet. So if he manages to connect later on, or I'm missing something, then we get him later. It would have been the, the perspective also from the Global Shippers Forum, but in that case from Sri Lanka. So, Sean, for the time being, will have to contribute in the writing. Then um, we move sort of more on the supplier industry side, although sometimes one could argue if the freight forwarder is the client or the carrier. But I went within the group then alphabetically. Uh, Andrea, you are the next one on my list from Fiat. Thank you very much, Jan, and thank you very much, Angtad, for having Fiata here with you all today. Um, and it's really um, good to have everyone around the table to really discuss this um, crucial issue. Um, Fiata previously held a high-level dialogue last month, actually um, on a uh, really very much looking at this issue uh, with key stakeholders across the supply chain, um, much more on the industry side. So I think it's great now that we have a really wide range of, um, of stakeholders here on the panel today. Um, and um, yeah, and it was really including UNCTAD, ports, shippers, shipping lines, freight forwarders, and maritime analysts. 
um, to address the bottlenecks in the maritime supply chain. Um, and um, it's really encouraging to have us all together um, because I think it's very important, and this is really very much Fiat's position, that uh, we all have a responsibility to the supply chain and um, industry and governments really need to work together to resolve these issues. Uh, noting also that ensuring functioning supply chains is crucial for economies all around the world, um, and it really helps businesses of all sizes reach global markets and um, helps businesses to bring those goods to where they are needed. So as we all know, the maritime supply chain is really in uncharted territory. Um, I don't think I need to go into much more detail about that right now. I think um, it was very well illustrated by Jan already. Um, and it's clear that in the immediate term, there is a need to address the current congestion. And I think that this is something that really requires the recognition and the use of the key and very different roles that each actor plays within the supply chain. Um, as we discussed in our high level dialogue last month, this it was clear that this is not the product of a global demand boom, but that this crisis has simply exposed the vulnerabilities um, in the supply chain, um, which would need to have the focus of governments together with industry um, to cooperate to find solutions. Um, we've seen that landside infrastructure has already been at its limits for a while now, and the consequences of the pandemic was really the final trigger that led to the current disruption. And this isn't surprising because containers move from ship via the terminals to rail, barge and truck. And if not all um, modes and interfaces are developed simultaneously and given the time to develop, the system will collapse. It is really the rule of the weakest link. So, um, on its Fiat's position that there is a clear need to strengthen not only the infrastructure, um, including connectivity uh, from the port to the hinterland and beyond, but also the international policies and framework supporting intermodal transport. As uh, James from the GSF just mentioned, it's really important that we really focus on uh, multimodal and intermodal transport, noting that there are huge dependencies between the different modes of transport. And uh, Fiat strongly believes in the necessity of continuing work on the implementation of the WTO Trade Facilitation Agreement, ensuring the improved efficiency and release uh, and clearance of goods, including single window is crucial, um, and to have greater cooperation between governments and with industry. And this should also include enhanced cooperation with SMEs to ensure that policies are really workable and practicable for all. I'm hurrying up because I know that I'm getting close to my five minutes, um, but really I think um, one thing that's very important is to ensure greater cooperation and interconnectivity, to ensure the need for it is addressed for greater visibility and predictability in order to better manage the supply chain. For example, we've seen that the increased dwell times of containers and terminals is an issue for terminal productivity. And um, Fiatta really believes that this could be reduced through better communication among the stakeholders, which would make it much more possible to organize the next mode of transport and ensure funding certainty. And last but not least, We've seen already through the pandemic an acceleration of digitalized processes, and this is something that can now really be further leveraged to increase this efficiency and visibility. And Fiat strongly believes that through its work through um, the digital strategy, that it can really address some of these aspects. And it's important that such digital solutions are really accessible to all, um, interoperability and inclusivity being co cornerstones of the digital strategy of theater. And this will be important for economies and players in all phases of their development to leverage these digital processes. Thank you very much, Jan. Thank you very much, uh, Andrea. Uh, a combination of, of focus on, on practical issues, the congestion intermodal, the WTFA agreement, which for us is also very practical. Uh, so next on my list would have been Johanna, but Johanna has been replaced by Casper. So we switch the alphabet, so J to K, then we, afterwards we go back to, to J. Uh, thank you very much, Global Maritime Forum, for, for being with us. Uh, so Casper, thank you for joining us. Thank you, and thank you for the invitation. Um, I'm going to build on, on some of the things that you said in your initial 
presentation when you highlighted decarbonization as one of the issues that are going to have a long-term impact on our industry. And, and I think when, when, whenever we look at both dealing with the short term and the longer term challenges of, of, of maritime logistics, I think it's important to have the focus on the wholesale change of the way our industry is fueled and operated that's going to take place over the coming decades if we are to stay within the Paris Agreement. And, and it has a couple of implications that I think are particularly important for policymakers. One is that, uh, as you mentioned, the fuels are likely to be more, more expensive. This will come at different impacts on different states. So how do we ensure that this transition has happened, happened in a way that is just and equitable and, and takes into account the needs of developing countries? How do we ensure that the investments that are going to be needed in infrastructure, both to support hopefully global, global trade and ensure the connectivity, but also to make that transition, how do we ensure that those are funded? And how do we create clarity for the companies that are going to invest billions of dollars in building that new fuel and, and ship supply chain? Uh, and of course, I think one of the reasons why we're seeing that some companies are holding back on making that investment is that currently the investment uh, situation, what are the right technologies, what are, what are the right vessels to invest in, given the, the long lifespan of ships, it's really highly uncertain. So creating some kind of policy clarity about the direction of travel and, and creating certainty that the right policy measures will be put in place to actually allow that investment is, is crucial. And I think the final thing that, that I think is very important not to overlook when we talk about supply is we have ships, but we also have people manning those ships. And I think one of the things that we've seen the past two years with the crew change crisis and now hundreds of thousands of seafarers being impacted is if they had stopped working, the issues we're having right now would have been are nothing compared to this. And we've seen in certain countries like the UK where, where, where the truck drivers, suddenly there was a shortage. Imagine the huge shortage of seafarers for this. And especially if we, if we look into a future where we're going to need to uh, have ships operating on more complicated fuels where we need to train people to operate this. We really need to have that long-term perspective and look at what are we going to need from 2030 onwards in terms of infrastructure, in terms of training, and in terms of, 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 of that whole just and equitable transition that we need to see. And I think for policymakers, one big ask is A, really encourage and allow crews to change uh, because that is important in, in the short term. Really treat seafarers as key workers so we can keep those chains working and we can get seafarers that want to return to their ships. I think that's something you can do short term. I think long term really use the opportunity at the IMO to really engage in the debate on, on the revision of the, of the greenhouse gas strategy. The timeline is 2023. This is the opportunity to really lay the tracks that create clarity for the industry, but also addresses some of the just and equitable transition issues. And I think one of the conversations and we've seen proposals and I know, uh, at least I saw that Patrick Verhoeven is, is going to be speaking later from the IPH that has raised this opportunity. Is there an opportunity to raise funds through a market-based measures that can help close the competitiveness gap, but also be invested in the infrastructure needs uh, and create that resilience across the, the value chain? So I think whenever we look at planning for the long term, we need to take decarbonization into account. We need to take into account the need for policy clarity to drive investments, but also to address just an equitable transition, make sure that those countries that are disproportionately negatively impacted are compensated because we need that to create a, a global regulation. So it's not an easy task and we need all, all countries to help support this and really help move this debate forward because we don't have a lot of time to waste. Thank you, Anne. Thank you very much, Caspar. Uh, also that GMF joined us and there were a few people who had changed last minute. Th thank you. And thank you for the whole initiative. Uh, I think we really have seen a, a big shift in momentum and attitude over the last, I would even say just two years or even last year, a big momentum. And I think you and your colleagues can claim some, some credit for, the, for this. Uh, thank you, Casper, uh, replacing Johanna. Um, before I give the floor to John in a minute, we have one or two participants who are listening to us, they, you will get the correct link in a minute. Cecilia is working on this. Um, John, World Shipping Council, what can we slash policymakers do to solve the supply chain crisis or is there a crisis? Yeah, and thank you. And, and thanks to Ontad for the invitation. Uh, the World Shipping Council represents the, uh, the liner shipping industry, uh, container carriers and, and vehicle carriers. Uh, I agree with a lot of what's been said already, but let me offer four recommendations about what policymakers can do to improve supply chain capacity. The first, and I, I think the most fundamental, 
is that we have to see the problem for what it is. It's an end-to-end -end supply chain saturation with now the most critical problem being an inability of landside infrastructure to handle the volume of cargo. Now, much of the landside fall down has been triggered by COVID. Uh, we've had continuing port and, and warehouse shutdowns in some key markets and also large scale worker displacement uh, leading to low inland capacity, whether that's rail, truck, warehouse or distribution centers or in many cases, all of the above. The second point that I would make, and, it, and it's related to the first, is I would urge you not to seek to fight the market by aiming regulatory actions at isolated parts of the supply chain. That will only make things worse. In the United States, for example, the House of Representatives made this mistake just last week when it passed a bill that would put regulators in charge of how ships are loaded and how shippers and carriers negotiate their contracts. Both of those actions, if enacted into law, uh, would remove flexibility from a system that needs more flexibility, not less. Third, once you identify those problems that are the true operational bottlenecks, seek to provide additional capacity where it will do the most good. Again, an example in the US, uh, some ports are successfully shifting cargo off of the terminals, particularly import cargo, for later handling at inland locations. When this can be done without stranding truck chassis or rail cars, it increases fluidity in the terminals. That allows ships to move more freely, which in turn increases effective capacity. And, and Jan made reference to this earlier that when everything slows down, the effective capacity of the system is reduced, even though we have many, many physical assets in play. So if we can Increase the fluidity in the terminals, allow the ships to get back on schedule, uh, that increases the effective capacity of the whole system. And that in turn is what will bring rates back to a more normal level. The only thing that's changed with respect to the structure of the market or the functioning of the market since the onset of COVID is COVID. We haven't had increased consolidation. We haven't had you know, any, any structural changes in the players in the supply chain, it's the effects of COVID and the effects of changes in the way goods are being ordered and received. And so if we can get back to a situation of fluidity, we have the assets uh, in the market. We have the ability to move the amount of cargo that we're moving. We're just not doing it very efficiently right now. And then finally, I would just offer that when it comes to long-term solutions, let's use the fact that the world now recognizes the importance of global supply chains. Let's use that recognition to direct investment into those supply chain nodes that can't be expanded on short notice. You can't build massive infrastructure in a matter of months or even a matter of years. It takes long-term investment. In many cases, that should have happened years ago, but let's not squander the recognition of the importance of the global supply chain now. Let's take this opportunity to invest in that long-term infrastructure. And that will help make us ready for the next major challenge, whatever that may be because we know whatever it may be, it will surely come. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, John. <laughs> and I do see uh, that uh, Jörn Klippel now also joined. He was in the wrong room. And I think <laughs> I've seen a few others uh, have, have joined. Uh, excellent. It's really a great panel. And we have uh, now another one with the flag of Fiat, but uh, uh, Bjorn, we, we have a list. Uh, you have seen that. Uh, you will. Yep. It will be your turn in, in five. 
Uh, uh, Stefan uh, Graber, also from Fiat, but before that uh, with the uh, Geneva and the Swiss Trading and Shipping Association. So you can also actually, you could have worn the hat of the shipper as well. So Stefan, what can we slash policymakers do to overcome the supply chain crisis? I, we don't hear you. You are not muted, but we still do not hear you. Okay. So now it's better. Yeah, now we hear you. Okay. So thank you very much for, for the invitation today. So as I uh, said earlier, Fiat I believe that uh, there is a need to look at uh, in international policy. Actually, I think we hear you through the microphone of Andrea, because her frame was all of a sudden on. If you are in the same office. Yeah, yeah. so let me, it's better like that? Now it's better. Okay, so I will try like this. Okay. <laughs> so, um, I said that Fiat believe that there is a, a need to look in international uh, policies and frameworks supporting intermodal and maritime transport, as we, we said before, as some of these policies seems to be uh, not fit for purpose uh, on the, for the new environment. In, in particular, we think that it's important to strengthen the frameworks to allow for more level playing field and diversification of the actors active in the supply chain. Uh, we need to be aware that the logistic industry is composed uh, of many SMEs with strong local footprint that plays an important role in local economies. The current situation should not result in the situation where these actors are excluded by uh, the expansion of a few large uh, global conglomerates. And it's absolutely essential to protect the diversity of the supply chain. And here my perspective is more a long-term perspective. Uh, if we don't want to, to see a further erosion of the economic fabric of developing countries. And I, 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 I think that we have, a, uh, as we said, we are an unknown ter territory with an exceptional situation. We see that uh, there are some profit generated out of this. And the que a question could be raised uh, how these profits should be uh, reinvested. Should it go to uh, vertical integration or consolidation on, by some actors, or should it go uh, to, to tackle down decarbonization? Because we know that the next challenge is, and that was mentioned before, uh, is in front of us. Decarbonization is there. It will have a cost. It will have a huge cost. And uh, probably some of this money would be better used for that. So some governments around the world have already shown concern today on, for example, the market competitive structure and all actors on the supply chain uh, should be certainly concerned to support the policymakers to adapt and enforce the regulatory frameworks that allows for inclusivity. Uh, we saw the work that is done uh, in the US by, uh, for example, the Federal Maritime Council. Uh, we know that uh, US, Europe, China are key in matter uh, and international organizations should work closely with those policymakers together with the private sector. As we said be before, we should have really a collaboration of all the actors in order to find a balanced approach to this issue. And this includes also the carbonization and ensure economic welfare for all stakeholders and not only a few. And uh, I think really that uh, th there is this need for, for communication. We talk about our high level dialogue that I think is a good step in the right direction. So we are committed to, to defend in this crisis and beyond the variety of stakeholders in the supply chain and mainly the SMEs companies participating in the supply chain around the world. But because as we know that they are core of economic development. So, and this economic development is positive for everyone. So we need to be careful. And uh, I, I just here yeah, complement a little bit uh, what Andrea said before. It, we need to be aware that we are not creating today in this crisis, uh, some issue that we will have in the future and uh, that we, we try to, to accept the crisis as it is. It is a crisis. We heard that there are different reasons for that, uh, but we need to be careful that we are not generating the, the, the problems for tomorrow, and uh, we end up in an even worse situation after. So that was just for my compliment. Thank you, Jan. Thank you, uh, Stefan. Um, 
Yeah, um, I'm happy to see that the perspective which we grouped, like the shippers, cargo interest, and then industry, there's actually quite a lot of convergence, um, although, yeah, also different focuses, highlights. I now have a, a group here that I called analysts. Um, maybe we are all like to be analysts in one way or another. Um, but happy that uh, Alan Murphy could join us. He can't be with us all the time, but we scheduled it uh, that Alan, uh, if you are with us at this moment, we said from four o'clock onwards. So there you are. Alan, good to have you back. Thank what you. What can we slash policymakers do to overcome the supply chain crisis? Well, it's it's funny. I was uh, and I'll, I'll be focusing on container ship because that's a, that's our sure. expertise. Um, I'm actually going to answer the question on what regulators can do and governments can do now to to help the, the crisis in container shipping. Uh, the same way when I was asked the same question in 2015 and 2016, when freight rates were far below the cost of moving containers, uh, when all the shipping lines were struggling and threat of bankruptcy and disruption to the to, to, to container shipping markets, um, I'm going to give the same answer. Do as little as possible when it comes to policy to force shipping lines to do A, B, or C. Um, no intervention directly into the shipping lines. This is not, it's not a question of the shipping lines, um, uh, not, you know, trying to profiteer the, 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 the best and creating a supply chain crisis. Um, it is pandemic induced. It's an, it, it, and, and let's let's briefly touch upon what can actually then be done, but but directly going in and forcing shipping lines to take cargo from certain regions, or to force shipping lines to deploy vessels into certain regions, or uh, to force them to move empties or anything like that. Um, that's not really what we do in a free market. Um, so so direct intervention into the shipping lines I would strongly advise against. And and. What would it help? Um, right now, uh, I, I believe John might have touched upon, I'm sorry for the first being able to join now, uh, the, 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 the latest uh, Shipping Act re revision. Um, it, it's, it's fully understandable to be sympathetic to the plight of the, the US exporter. Um, but if shipping lines are forced to, to take US export cargo, um, we're not gonna shorten the crisis, we are gonna lengthen it. Um, the problem is not the shipping lines won't accept export cargo, it's that they won't accept export cargo at the rates that the exporters are willing to pay for it. Um, if, if freight rates on the back haul out of the US, for example, were the same level as the import, the shipping lines would gladly take the cargo, but that, that's simply not the case. So let, let's understand why we are in this crisis in container shipping. It is pandemic induced. First of all, uh, the notion of a global demand boom, I want to cut down. There is no such thing as a global demand boom. Global demand as growth over the last normal year of 2019 or 2018 has been around two to three percent, completely within the the long term uh, stable growth that we've seen, uh, modest stable growth that the industry normally can handle. The problem is that it's not balanced growth. It's North America that demand is 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 excess in. Um, we're talking uh, annualized over 2019. We're talking about an annualized growth of of more than 10% in every month since, since July 2020. And that's more than the US system could handle. And that's why we have 100 container vessels parked outside of, of Los Angeles and Long Beach right now. Now, we, we've done some studies on it and roughly on the Trans-Pacific to the West Coast, 30% uh, of all capacity is simply being lost uh, to congestion and vessel delays. Globally speaking, more than 12% of container shipping capacity is lost to congestion. Um, and that congestion is primarily driven out of North America. I understand that we analysts are often accused of having a, a bias and always being focused on, on the East-West trades and the big markets, but, but this time it's, it's, it's actually justified because the problem is in, in North America. If we solve North America, there would be enough capacity for the rest of the system. Um, all the capacity has been taken out because of North America. Which also tells us to solve the problem, we have to look at North America. And the problem is that the hinterlands, it's not the shipping lines, it's actually not even the ports, it's the hinterland infrastructure that simply has been woefully underinvested and ready to handle this. And this is the problem. For 10 years, the system has had far too much slack, far too much overcapacity. Um, and the shipping lines, why, do we, why did we go from basically 20 global shipping lines to about seven or eight? Well, that's because they couldn't make any money. 
Uh, that's why we have the long, long clamored for con uh, consolidation. Now we're in a situation where we need all that excess capacity and people are saying, oh, why are the carriers, why don't they have uh, a supple and, and full amount of, of, of excess capacity to handle a crisis like this? Well, because then they would go bankrupt. Um, so we are in a situation now where we need to get the, 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 the hinterland functioning and flowing again in the US. Now, I'm a container shipping expert. I'm not a trucking or rail expert. Uh, I have seen some novel suggestions putting in the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers and, and, and simply taking all the containers that are stuck in the ports and sticking them in, in a desert in California or in Arizona and with all the empties. We have a problem that a lot of empties are clogging up the ports in the U.S. because the shipping lines right now, they have had a shortage of empties, but all the factories in China have been pumping them out. So the shipping lines really want to get the vessel. They've been waiting for two weeks outside of Long Beach. They want to get that vessel back to Asia, um, and they have empties out there from the factories. So we, we do have a problem clogging up the system. We've solved this in the past by putting in uh, sweeper vessels, so putting in 20,000 TU vessels um, uh, just to evacuate empties out of, of Long Beach. But we don't have any excess vessels. All the vessels are put to use. Everything that can float right now is sailing. And that also means if somebody could magically conjure up 100 new vessels, um, all that would happen is the number of vessels stuck outside of Long Beach would be 200 rather than 100. Um, not until we solve it in, in, in the hinterland, or we see demand come down. And demand is driven by a shift from, from consumption of services into durable goods. The US consumer spends traditionally 65% of their disposable income on services. Now they only spend 60%, and that shift is what's knocked down the system. So either the pandemic ends, or we manage to unclog the hinterland, um, or we wait for 2023 when the new vessels uh, are getting delivered. There's no easy solution to you, I'm afraid. Thank you very much, uh, Alan. What a pity. Why did I invite you? No easy solutions. <laughs> But then that's part of the, the deal to have the realistic. Thing. Thank, thanks so much for, for joining us. And I think you missed some of the early interventions, but, but what you said goes in line with what some, some others had also said, like, like John and others. Um, Antonella, you have seen some of your data used, abused by us. Uh, thank you for this collaboration and happy to have you with us. You, you also work with the Global Shippers Forum. You help them to assess the situation. So. What can we slash policymakers do to solve the supply chain crisis? Okay, yes, thank you very much for the invitation, Jan, and uh, for the opportunity. Okay, so I, I think that uh, blaming uh, the pandemic and say that this is due to the pandemic is a little bit unfair and a little bit misleading as well, in the sense that if the pandemic has done something, is highlighting the difficulty and the challenging that is tested, in other terms, the resilience of the industry and the, the challenging difficulty that the industry would have faced at some point anyway. Because there are, I mean, the industry in such a form now that uh, is uh, not resilient. And uh, the, it's not undeniable that the major change in the industry has been the consolidation, okay? I'm not here to say that the consolidation is the cause and I'm not even here to say that a more fragmented market would have been, would have addressed the situation more, you know, better. And it's not even the point. The point is, uh, if uh, the, what the COVID has done is highlighted the fragility of the industry. Of course, I don't have the magic solution like Alan. I don't know if uh, and what in one action policymaker can do to solve all the problems. What I think is important for the regulatory to do is monitoring the industry. Okay, intervention from the regulatory authority might remove flexibility, but I think that at some point they have a duty <laughs> to do it if there is a disproportion of advantage and disadvantage that the players are experiencing. And I'm thinking about two points mainly. One is price and the effect that these are having on inflation, and the other is connectivity. I mean, you cannot stand, stay back and uh, say, this is market force. There is a duty. There is something that the regulatory should do, at least 
monitoring the, 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 the situation. And uh, then the intervention, of course, is up to them. I'm not a policymaker advisor. I'm only here to say what they should do. What I'm here to say is that uh, a good monitoring system is uh, important. And some of this is what, as Jan was alluding to, Green MDST, so with the, the Global Shipper Forum, putting together some, we are putting fact, together eight KPIs and the, with the massive thanks to Olaf, that I know is in the room, and to Jan as well, that we have some collaboration there in, for the, 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 the quarterly review. So what we think is important to uh, highlight is how the market is evolving. And uh, if uh, there is a, uh, in, in, in hint that there is some disproportion, again, cause and advantage amongst the party, I think there is a duty here. <laughs> we cannot not intervene. <laughs> and uh, just for those who are not familiar with uh, the, the quarterly review, what we suggest, and that happy to do this uh, for more, in, you know, in a, in a stronger collaboration with Jan or its members, <laughs> is looking at demand, the way demand is evolving, the way supply is evolving, and how the two merge together, and uh, how the competitiveness is evolving, and this is a job that we do with Olaf, how the port connectivity is evolving, and this is a job that we do with, uh, with Jan, and how the CO2 emission per TU is changing over time. And these are a few of the, the, the indicators that we have. So if anything, and this concretely is not just a nice intention. This is what we do, and happy to do more in more detail with uh, UNCTAD is monitoring the industry. So this is a simple intervention. I'm sorry, I don't have the magic answer, but uh, happy to do something in real terms. Small, but something. <laughs> Thank you very much, Antonella. And uh, we are still with A and uh, analysts uh, and move now to AFOC uh, from America. <laughs> uh, what, what is your assessment? And, and we have heard some focus on what is happening, especially in the United States. Uh, what, what, is, what can policymakers in the US or globally or elsewhere do to solve the crisis? Ashok, you have the floor. Yeah, and uh, first of all, uh, thank you. And an absolute privilege to, to participate and contribute to this untied uh, forum. Um, for the for the uh, advantage of the audience, is it possible for me to to put up two or three slides on the screen, um, Jan? Uh, you can do this if this helps you to stay within your three to five minutes. Yes, uh, the I would, uh, for the work. Go ahead. Food, I would food, I would try and do that. So can can you all see that at all? Yeah. yeah okay. All right. Um, so so the, so the reason why I'm doing this, of course, is, uh, is is for the sake of time and the fact that we don't have much of much of time here. And so, we, you know, to answer both your questions, I have, have put uh, put two slides for each. And so let me let me go to the first one. What can policymakers do to help reduce freight rates? Well, a solution uh, to the hitherto unsustainable logistics cost. Uh, lies pretty much with the stakeholders, regulators, and sovereign nations that govern ports. Um, it is fairly evident uh, that the economic health of nations in an increasingly globalized and integrated world that we see today cannot be imagined without the physical well-being of all its people. The world is clearly not having a united response to global vaccination mechanisms that will disrupt and delay any recovery that may be short-lived and regional at best. So here are the, some of the suggestions uh, uh, for the policymakers that may not be exhaustive and all uh, encompassing. Uh, my, my first point is vaccinate the world. Policymakers around the world have to take the pandemic head on and plan to vaccinate the entire global population. Uh, vaccine makers do have enough capacity to produce and vaccinate the entire world, but large parts of the population remains under vaccinated. The WHO, the WHO, I would think, through its COVAX program, is well positioned to actually achieve this. Uh, the next, my next point, of course, is is going back to uh, you know a consolidated slide on uh, on the TFA uh, reforms. Uh, trade facilitation agreement actually entered into force on uh, in 2017, but we still find a whole lot of bureaucratic delays and red tape, which pose a burden for moving goods across borders for traders. Trade facilitation 
which is the simplification, modernization, and harmonization of export and import processes has therefore emerged as an important issue for the world trading system. Uh, the third thing that I would point out is the WTO uh, legal framework, uh, which is which is basically, uh, you know, we are, we are all talking about, uh, you know, goods being traded, large amounts of goods being traded worldwide in the last few years, and advances in technology and computerization of business transactions have added a sense of urgency to the need to make uh, to make the rules more uniform. Um, how, how can we, how can we, uh, you know, not discuss this issue without looking at at the at the great job that ASICUDA uh, may have done? It is almost running in more than ninety countries, but we still have issues with respect to, uh, you know, things like the capacity of automated systems. It is understood that a significant number, close to 55% of the stakeholders do not use electronic signatures even today. Uh, the World Customs Organization is another one. Smooth distribution of vaccines is absolutely necessary. And the, and the WCO has actually come up, uh, you know, um, uh, with its efforts to, to uh, which will actually constitute the fundamental basis of a global uh, recovery. Uh, the last but not the least in, in, uh, in answering question one is the IMO's FAL convention, facilitation of maritime traffic. Uh, it makes it mandatory for ships and ports to exchange FAL data electronically and encourage the use of so-called single window concepts. Uh, the low conformity rate with the FAL requirement stresses the need for accelerating digitalization to mitigate the impact of crises such as the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. Uh, going back to the next question, to the second question, uh, I would think of the following. Uh, envisaging the future with accuracies like gazing in a crystal ball, the world today is complex and embraces many different realities which can be sometimes contradictory. Energy transition and the march towards zero carbon future seems to be the right approach and has its costs too. Traditional transition to a non-fossil fuel transport and supply chain may increase the nominal cost, which is cost before taking into account the cost to human health, environment, and extreme weather patterns in the short to medium term, but not the real cost in the long term. So here are the here are the following. Uh, assuming that most of the short, medium uh, term reforms have already been achieved and the pandemic is in the rear view mirror. I am looking to enhance resilience using the power of digitalization, artificial intelligence, and IoT. Uh, by doing the following first, uh, in, uh, reduce cost and increase visibility communication, uh, including uh, technology that is on the horizon, things like Starlink, Kuiper, and on web systems. Collective approach to supply chain uh, reliance on multiple geopolitical competitors. And of course, I like the idea of the UNCTAD three cluster approach, which is contactless, seamless, and cooperative trade. Thank you. Thank you, Ashok. Thank you very much. Uh, happy to see that several of UNCTAD solutions are considered useful. This is what, of course, we also. Uh, hope and expect and it is actually true since the this pandemic started we have had a real surge in demand for many of these solutions so, so thanks for this uh, happy to have uh, Bjorn Klippel with us um, don't know whether Bjorn was there when I shared one of your tables you had provided yeah. for the review about the freight rates which nice illustrate the impact of imbalances for example Bjorn what can policymakers do to solve the supply chain crisis well, Jan, thank you very much for asking. I'm, uh, I, I'm feeling privileged to be invited to give a question, uh, but I would uh, like to not draw on my own very limited experience uh, of about 25 years in the industry. Uh, I, I took a different path to serve this splendid audience. Uh, a word to our background, I'm representing as, an, as, a, as a founder uh, and longtime managing director and owner uh, Tim Consult, uh, since a couple of years, called Transporion Market Intelligence because uh, I, I, I sold my company to Transporion, one of the leading providers of co connectivity and visibility in the transportation 
uh, space and we are serving shippers at the end of the day. So I think John Butler, say, approached it from an association standpoint. Uh, the job of, of my team for 20 years now is to do or was benchmarking, market intelligence providing and the supporting of tenders. Uh, we are serving about 100 big world-class companies on average moving 100,000 TU, uh, each of them procuring these services and the mother company Transporion is supporting as one of their activities, uh, tenders by their software systems and in the ocean space alone, uh, the, the, the teams are running and supporting more than 4,000 uh, ocean related tenders a year. What I want to say is we have a kind of an intimate uh, servicing relationship to a number of customers and I took liberty besides what we are regularly exchanging with them in support of their tendering and learning their concerns, particularly in the crisis, as you can well imagine, I took liberty in inviting some of their comments, passing the straightforward uh, questions of Jan to them and, and inviting big automotive companies, FMCG, say, you as the decision maker responsible for running global supply chains, for buying services, particularly ocean related, what is your view of what should we ask the policymakers to consider or also following John's advice to not consider? And I like to structure it in the two, say, questions, short term side of it and mid and long term side of it. I mean, the short term can be easily answered. I don't, know, I don't need to to uh, outline again uh, the reasons why we are in the current troubles called the maritime uh, crisis, they are all known to us. On the short term side, I think all of our customers in unison say, we don't think, we cannot think of any directive or regulatory action that can really contribute to solving the problems. I mean, there are market forces at play. Yes, uh, in an unprecedented form and the service and rate Consequences are also new to everybody in that industry. I'm speaking container shipping in, in, in particular. Uh, none of these big companies really thinks of uh, policy makers can be a help short term. Yes, second point, there was a call for action from some uh, to the competition authorities uh, uh, complaining about misuse of market power, perhaps even alluring to collu collusion somewhere. But I think we did not see uh, regulators taking action. And as long as no substance is, is available, um, there will be none. Yeah? So uh, also mo the majority of our customers um, don't see a solution on that side. And, and, and eventually, of course, uh, they are very much in favor of governments encouraging their operators, their ports, et cetera, uh, to be more flexible, to create capacity by 24-7 operations, and that it took more than a year down the crisis uh, before some American ports, which are choke points, as we all know, to really go over to a, to a, a say, a more sustained, a more permanent operating mode is, of course, something that everybody uh, supports. But in order to sum up, on the short-term side of the game, uh, our big Customers, our, our big shippers, all of them uh, are not, not not seeing any effective means for a for a, for a policymaker uh, to 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 intervene and to solve to help solve the problem. There are market forces at play, and uh, the, the the speakers before me made that totally clear. There is absolute consensus here. Now, if we move mid and long term, and mid and long term it is because whatever policy can do takes time to take to have impact. Uh, the question was, what are the anticipated risks, shortcomings to the supply chains in the future? And uh, again, they see it very much in the same line. First of all, ports and hinterland. Secondly, say the human factor is still very of very large importance in supply chains, manual work, manual processes, and people can get ill or locked out, locked down, computers not so much. Uh, there is indeed an industry consolidation, uh, say, anxiety, looking down the road, uh, uh, the reduction, the ongoing reduction of, of options to choose from, and not just horizontally, the 20 
carriers providing 80% of capacity now down to seven or eight. We also see it on the vertical side uh, with Maersk, say, following a particular strategy with carriers buying uh, forwarders, recently port operators buying forwarders. So there is, say, some concern what that could mean for the, for the number of options to choose from in future. And last but not least, the question of there will be one more crisis, one more pandemic coming in the future. Can we be sure we, the shippers, depending on a, on a well-working supply network, um, uh, that, the, that, that policymakers around the world have taken the proper learnings? I mean, yes, uh, I'm German, and uh, we used to be very proud on, the, on a very straightforward, stringent, and effective government. If I look at wave four and the conversations about wave five possibly coming, I'm not sure that all policymakers have, have heard the bang. Now, um, now, what does that mean? Yeah. Now, if you ask, yeah. now yes. yeah. I'm looking at my watch and uh, give me one more minute, please. You had prepared uh, some really nice slides, and in order to be quicker, you did not use them. <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> yeah, no, uh, just 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 to call up what what they were suggesting for for consequences. I mean, first of all, uh, we need to expand and modernize infrastructures, policymakers, public investment. On the, on the port and hinterland side. And there was even one suggesting why the UNCTAD or UN does not consider to have a fund, particularly to support developing countries which may lack the resources. The second point is, let's do everything to make ports and hinterland more performant, yeah, 24 seven, et cetera, et cetera. Um, third aspect, automate, digitize and standardize, keep going on, on that side uh, in order to reduce this say human factor, which is so injurable. Uh, fourth factor, protect competition. Yes, horizontally, vertically, they call for a very painstaking uh, view of the regulators on what is going on on one side. And there are, of course, always ideas coming back if the exemption of the Europeans towards the consortia shouldn't be either, say, reconsidered or perhaps a continued exemption in future tied to say commitments of the carriers to more green uh, ship investments, et cetera, et cetera. And lastly, that's indeed uh, uh, the point uh, that they argue for uh, policymakers to consider what can be done to say incentivize carriers to, in, to invest earlier and more in the, in the green ships needed in future. There is one or the other voice, last comment who asks for to consider postponing IMO 23 because we are all afraid that it will consume shipping capacity. I'm not sure if that's a good idea or if that's an idea that should be widely supported, but that is the scope of what our customers say. So in order to summarize, we there, there are hopes that policymakers take the right decisions. Everybody knows that this will be of limited impact and of slow uh, impact because at the end of the day, the markets have to take care of it and our customers are adjusting their strategies accordingly. Thank you. Thank you, Bjorn. Thank you for having uh, spread the word and got additional input from your from your members, your clients. I was about to say, if I were German, I would now have interrupted you and made you stick to the time. Um, let us uh, move to the next little cluster, the ports perspective. Uh, ports were mentioned um, uh, several uh, times in terms of uh, congestion and, and um, places where improvements can be made. Now we have uh, among us Ben from Scherpenzel from the International Task Force Port Core Optimization. I think you have some specific solutions, uh, Ben, where I saw you earlier, but now I don't see where has Ben gone. Okay, I blame Bjorn for having frightened away Ben. If Ben comes back, hang, maybe we need to let him in again, or there's other ways to. No, Jan, I think Ben said that he has to rush for another meeting. And okay. He at 5 p.m. Okay, okay. Okay, I sorry, I, I was not um, reading all the chat and comments. Yeah, thanks a lot, uh, Frida. Okay. Uh, then uh, another very special guest from very far away, Captain Karupia Subramaniam. Um, really appreciated that you are still awake in Kuala Lumpur. I think the time now is, is 11. 
half past 11 or something. Um, so, that's good again. Yeah, no, th thank you very much. So that's the IAPH, uh, and, and we have really a lot of good collaboration with the IAPH, with the Sustainable Port Program, with Patrick, with uh, many, many good things, and, and really appreciate your insights. And, and of course, the IAPH, you are the, the public sector ports, you are, but you're also you have port operators. So in a way, you are those for whom our recommendations are made. <laughs> so we are slowly moving to the target to the public sector government. Uh, Captain Subramaniam, what, what can we do to solve the supply chain crisis? Thank you, Ian. Uh, the pandemic has taught us to stay, stay awake late <laughs> to join <laughs> webinars like this. So I think we're getting used to it. Uh, anyway, thank you for the opportunity and the uh, privilege to join this uh, forum. I've heard uh, speakers uh, lay out so many interesting points uh, on how we need to go about to resolve this problem. Uh, but just let me let me start by asking this question. I think some of the speakers have alluded to this in a different way. Uh, the simple question is who is responsible for this for this mess we are in, for this conundrum that we are in? Uh, is it is it the consumers for demanding more goods to reach their doorsteps as they are all locked in today? Uh, is it the uh, shipping lines who uh, suddenly are indulged with uh, uh, requests for uh, additional shipping services? Is it the ports uh, who are inefficient? Or is it the pandemic that has caused all this? So I think we all discussed this and we said that this problem has been brewing for years. The, what the pandemic did was it has provided the final detonator, which is caused this massive explosion here today. Uh, I think this has been alluded by uh, the speakers earlier. Uh, we are seeing this mess due to our lack of inaction over the last years. We saw this problem coming, but we did not act fast enough. And this pandemic certainly taught us a lesson. So going forward, how do we get away from this perfect storm? Uh, do we think that the end of pandemic is going to end this problem? We don't think so. Uh, I think we, we, we have to deal with this problem for years to come. So a lot has been spoken about the ports. Uh, let me share some of the perspectives uh, from the ports view. Uh, you know, for, for many years, ports have always been the punching bag. We are the interface for ships. Uh, in the eyes of many people, we are seen as the final destination of ships. Uh, people are not concerned that cargo from the ships are actually passing through the ports to be delivered to other areas. And this is where the hinterland connectivity is so important. And we know in many countries, in many, many areas, that hinterland uh, connectivity is the biggest problem. And, and, and we are only as strong as the weakest link. If you have one link in the supply chain that is not effective, the whole supply chain is not going to be effective. So we have seen all these things coming together now and what the ports can do going forward is, uh, I think we need to change the way we are doing things in the port. I think we need to go back to the fact that many countries do not have a proper facilitator for the maritime and logistics industry. Uh, who is going to take this role? Is it the Ministry of Transport? Is it the, is it the, uh, the, the Ministry of uh, Trade? Uh, or is it, you know, the, who is going to take this? So uh, we've seen that over the years, the best model is to get ports to be the facilitator. Of course, we, don't, we can't control everything. We don't have everything under our control, but the ports apparently is in the best position to do this. As a trade facilitator, we would in a better, we would in a better position to coordinate with, first of all, the clearing agencies in the port. You know, we got to clear not just goods, we need to clear ships as well. The ships coming in late, anchoring outside, waiting for clearance, they're already wasting one hour, two hours of productive time at birth. Cargo reaches the terminal, it takes customs, it takes uh, uh, the government agencies, hours, if not days to clear those goods. Who is going to coordinate all this? So I think this is where the role of the port has suddenly uh, become more evident. 
And this is why I think many ports are now moving towards this role as a trade facilitator within the, the supply chain uh, ecosystem. And as what Ashok earlier mentioned, uh, some of the, the, the uh, concepts that we're looking at is even in the FAL convention, how do we clear ships fast? We need to have single window systems, port community systems, so that information and data can be shared at a press of a button, not just to one or two parties, to various parties simultaneously. And this is going to save a lot of time. Uh, and going forward, we need to link up with all our other players outside the port, the transporters, the warehouse operators, the manufacturers, the freight agents, custom brokers, shipping agents. Somebody has to do this. So it's about time the ports now own up and, 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 and we are going to do this now. The, the other area is, of course, uh, we spoke about this earlier, uh, infrastructure in ports. Did ports prepare themselves for this, for this uh, problem that we are having now? Did we provide enough infrastructure? Two years ago, we didn't have this problem. Uh, almost all ports were, were doing very well. They could accommodate shipping easily. Of course, there were delays here and there, but I don't think this problem was there. So it is not about the infrastructure that is in the port today. Uh, it is more of the sudden demand that has come. You know, it takes ports years to plan, years to get regulatory appro approval, years to, before we can even put the first pile into the, into the sea to build the wharf. Uh, it's unlike shipping. You, know, you want to order ships today, you go to a shipyard, you put in an order, you get it within a year and a half or two, right? So it's not that easy for ports. So ports take a little bit longer time, but I agree with what John Butler said. We need to look back. Uh, should we be supply driven for, for, for ports? Should we build more than what we need today? Uh, that is a finance uh, cost here. Uh, what if we are not utilized? What if suddenly tomorrow, this whole problem goes away and the ports are left with infrastructure that is not going to be used? How do we deal with that, that investment uh, and the recovery of investment? So it has to be planned in a, in a, in a proper manner. And this is why I think there's a, a need for collaboration between ports and shipping lines to understand where we are coming from. We need to know what ports, uh, what ships, uh, what shipping lines are planning for the future, so that we can build enough and adequate facilities to for us to accommodate those ships. And the other other issues, of course, we spoke about uh, digitalization. Uh, this has helped uh, the logistics sector in the in, in a certain way. We are one of those industries that are doing better than many other industries today the port and logistics and shipping industry because of our investment into digitalization, we are able to move forward. We are able to keep our ports open. We are able to keep our ships running, but we can do more. So there's a lot of investment now by ports into data uh, uh, or the digitalization systems that will assist in digitalization, sharing of data. And the other thing of course is how do we make ourselves resilient for the future? Have we learned lessons from the, from, from, from the pandemic here? So I think this is where the policymakers have to uh, come together to have clear policies going, going forward that the ports are in a proper position to deal with similar disruptions in the future. We're talking about earlier disruptions was more into decarbonization and, and ed energy efficiency and so on. But the pandemic is a different sort of disruption. We can't even go down on the ground. Ports were operating at 50% capacity. That is why cargo was bunching up in the ports. Uh, manufacturers were shut down. They couldn't take delivery of raw materials. Uh, they couldn't deliver their finished products to the ports. And when they did, the ships were not calling and the cargo was piling up in the ports. So we need to have proper policies with, to deal with this kind of disruptions. And this is where the policymakers have to put their heads together and come up with clear and simple policies that are consistent uh, for, for, for implementation. Uh, yeah, and I hope I've not gone past my time. Uh, I, I think I'll yes, stop there. 30 seconds. Uh, it's uh, a practical have... side of my, my, there, my no, approach. No, no, that's, that's, that's the I, idea. I, I would very... like to share this with all of you. Uh, thank you very much for the opportunity. Yeah. No, thank you very much. Much appreciated. Um, and I think that 
I, I'm quite happy, but I'm biased with the sequence we have. So we move to the ports and now we have uh, six more um, experts, stakeholders uh, who are really at the end for whom we are doing this, uh, like the public sector, government, international organizations, regional organizations. Um, so we have FAO, we have National Competition Authority, we have World Bank, OECD, ITF, ECLAC, and Association of Caribbean States. Um, I understand, Ricardo, you said you ha will have to leave soon. So if you promise to speak only four minutes, I can jump the alphabetical order and, and Ricardo will then have the floor first before I then give it to Dennis and then Eduardo. Ricardo from ECLAC, my where I spent seven fantastic years long ago. <laughs> okay, okay. I will do my best, uh, surely. Okay, uh, this is a fact. Freight rates have uh, risen exponentially, reaching historically high levels. But this is the current issue. Yeah, This is the, the issue that mark this time then. Uh, why the behavior of freight rates? It is related to the pandemic. Yes, yeah, sure, but a lot of things more. Huh? Uh, the pandemic has thrown the entire supply chain into turmoil, but in my opinion, and in the opinion of my team, explanations are, are partial. Yeah? Those uh, significant disruptions cannot be attributed to a single cause but are the result of the interaction of several, both consequences and causes of uh, disruptions are related to congestion in port terminal, shortage of warehouses, uh, lack of uh, workforce in terminals, shortage of drivers in the logistics chains, and a long list of causes or consequences. Yeah, um, and this mix of, uh, of, for instance, the Suez Canal closure or temporary closures of Chinese terminals, Chinese factories, etc. Yeah, but this is a mix of consequences and causes. And this mix is in the inception of a vicious circle. Yeah? In, in other words, we have a sum of problems, but all together, yeah? Then this occurred due to a series of factors, but let me say that there is some confusion among causes and consequences. For instance, the imbalance, the famous imbalance, the imbalance exists from the very startup of the container itself. It is not related to COVID or not exclusively related to COVID. And although the, all those reasons are understandable, it is necessary to mention two structural causes, the industry concentration and the vertical integration and the possible appearance of a risk premium that currently underlies the pricing in, in shipping. Then the big question is, uh, will freight rates even decrease and what we can do in that respect? And not, not using the crystal ball, I just only will mention some factors that they're in line to explain the decreasing process possibly will not rapidly act. Uh, you, Jan Hoffman, usually talk, talk <laughs> about this, and then it is not necessary to repeat, but uh, related to the continuous adjustment between supply and demand, the uncertainty caused by health em emergencies, the decarbonization cause, the delay in arrival new ships, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. But to get the question, let me say that in, in, in my opinion, the main issue to be concentrated about, yeah, the container maritime transport is a market uh, with many special characteristics and um, blah 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 about the characteristics. Of, of this market. But finally, it is a market which emits some possible oligopolistic signals. Then what can we do? 
ask any economist, but the, the response is only one, is to regulate. Uh, I am talking about antitrust or preventing trust uh, behaviors. And not only in the liner market, but other par parts of the chain too. And uh, main question is uh, by who? Uh, whoever has the capacity to do so. Hardly, obviously, the small economies. Uh, the, the, the right path, in my opinion, is the adoption of common policies at the regional level, as is uh, possibly the case in, in, in Europe. Then, in, in our opinion, regional cooperation is the key. Thank you. Thank you, Ricardo. The regional perspective, very much uh, what we worked on in within Latin America and, and actually trying to learn maybe from European Union. Good, we have um, five more public sector. Um, Dennis from the Food and Agriculture Organization. What can you do to overcome the supply chain crisis for food supplies, for example? Thanks, uh, Jan, and uh, welcome uh, here from, from Rome. Thank you very much for inviting uh, us. Uh, as you can see in my uh, background, I am here mostly speaking on behalf of the Agricultural Market Information System, which is hosted by FAO. So, of course, it is a bit influenced also okay. what FAO might, uh, might think. But I think in this context, it's actually better that I speak on behalf of, uh, of, of Amos. Uh, I've prepared actually also a couple of slides, uh, given, of course, the time constraints, but also how the discussion went, I realized that it actually would be of no use to go through go through these slides. So I completely revamped what I'm going to tell you now. I hope this uh, this is going to going to work out. Um, I will have to move away a little bit from just focusing on trade. I'm not an expert on uh, the shipping industry as uh, uh, all the other speakers were. Uh, we're not closely monitoring uh, the freight market, but it's of course one thing that we are looking at um, uh, for what we are mostly interested in, which, which is that uh, global food trade is happening uh, uninterrupted uh, and, and those uh, that need food get the food that they, that they want. Um, uh, the agriculture market information system, for those who may have never heard of it, uh, was um, uh, launched uh, exactly 10 years ago by the G20 ministers of Ag agriculture. Um, based on the experiences of the 2007-2008 food price crisis. And Amos, uh, in a nutshell, is basically there to prevent such a crisis from happening again. So we as well are looking very closely on, on, uh, on prices. And if they surge, of course, that is always a warning symbol. Whether or not we will then call it a crisis, like you seem to be quite comfortable now in doing for the freight market, is, is a different uh, question. Uh, food prices have also come up quite a bit. There is strong demand on agricultural commodities. Uh, maybe stronger in some countries and they are really driving the market, but it is at the end of the day, uh, uh, market development, supply and demand. Uh, the agriculture sector overall, uh, and including the uh, trade, uh, world food trade, has actually proved to be quite resilient uh, in the face of this uh, strong demand and of course the challenges posed by the COVID um, pandemic. Now, what COVID meant for our work uh, was, of course, also a warning sign, and that was mentioned by, by some of the uh, speakers before me. Uh, it was a warning sign that um, looking at just supply and demand statistics, which is typically what FAO would be doing, what Amos is very much doing, and basically assuming, okay, if there's enough supplies to feed the world, uh, that matches demand, then we're in a comfortable situation. That is not enough, because, of course, the supply also needs to get to where it is demanded. And uh, COVID just was a reminder that this cannot be for, taken for granted. Uh, there was a lot of uh, uncertainties, a lot of fears. But looking back now on the past two years that we've lived with the pandemic, I think at least for the agriculture sector, we can say that we're actually um, quite pleased and maybe even astonished how resilient the sector overall performed, including uh, the trade sector. Now, for the um, bulk food commodities that we're monitoring, uh, that's wheat, soybeans, maize, uh, and rice, uh, they are not usually shipped in containers, rice maybe being uh, an exception. So we are not really impacted by that, and the bulk uh, trade uh, was functioning quite smoothly. And maybe there are some lessons to be learned there because a lot of uh, is computerized 
a lot is automated, does not really depend on, on humans sitting there. Uh, the loading, unloading does happen quite automatically. Uh, and so in terms of the logistics challenges, uh, they were quite short lived and could be resolved pretty quickly. Um, policy challenges were actually much bigger uh, uh, that countries thought they needed to behave in a certain way uh, uh, faced with, with COVID. Um, so um, the, the challenge at the end of the day was not as big as it initially seemed. Uh, and so when we meet now, actually COVID is no longer a big uh, topic. And we're quite um, confident actually that you know, if uh, production and uh, uh, demand remains as it is predicted, uh, that eventually prices will also come down. So sometimes high prices are also the best recipe for high prices, uh, because of course they will give an incentive to produce more, and that might be the same also in the in the shipping uh, sector. Now, one thing that uh, why why did I say that uh, it, it might be important that I speak on behalf of Amos, um, recognizing that uh, the logistics aspect of our work is of course important, uh, really led us to reconsider working more on monitoring uh, the logistics sites of, of food trade. Uh, at choke points was already mentioned. Um, there are a list of choke points that are particularly important for um, food trade, global food trade. And these are not only maritime, they are also inland. The hinterland was mentioned here a couple of times. Um, they can be at port facilities. They can be, of course, at, uh, at shipping lanes, uh, straits, natural strains, the Suez Canal is mentioned here. But often they also involve uh, you know, basically getting uh, uh, produce from where it is uh, produced, harvested to the port, or then from the port to where it is consumed. Um, so what can we do uh, to help, hopefully help? We work very closely with uh, our countries. Uh, Amos has 28 main uh, food trading countries uh, um, among its members. Uh, we represent about 90% of global food trade. Um, so monitoring uh, choke points more closely, identifying where a potential problem could be, and then hopefully identifying together with our uh, colleagues solutions of how they can be addressed. And that might not be an overnight fix, as was said. If it is involving infrastructure, it is recognizing that something needs to be done. And then, of course, also um, doing the investments that are needed to hopefully overcome these, uh, these choke points in the future. So I do think that um, FAO, Amos in this, in, in this particular instance, could have a role in helping uh, also the, uh, the freight sector in, in identifying and monitoring these uh, choke points. Uh, and of course, also with your expertise, with uh, you know, some of the uh, associations members that spoke at this meeting, uh, you know, it would be great if you, we could, could get uh, your insights uh, to then advise our, our policymakers uh, to do the right decisions. Uh, so again, thank you very much for, for this opportunity. And I really hope that this is the start of a, of a longer collaboration and an exchange that we're extremely looking forward to having. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dennis. And I remember how we were trying to collaborate, identifying choke points with AIS data. And it's, it's, a, it's a very valid challenge and not well, maybe in future easier to tackle if more data becomes available. No, thanks for joining a different angle here on the food. Um, next um, is uh, with us uh, Eduardo Gonzalez, Conacam from Paraguay. I saw you were just uh, connecting with uh, somehow get, getting the right Wi-Fi signal and the sound. Eduardo, gracias por estar con nosotros. So what is, what can you, the competition authority, do to solve the supply chain crisis? Okay, then, well, good morning or good afternoon, depending on the country and continent of everyone on this UNTAC virtual ad hoc meeting are. Well, as you say, I'm Eduardo Gonzalez, I'm a member of the board of CONACOM, National Competition Authority in Paraguay. Uh, so, we discuss in our agency about this question. Can we show do to reduce the current and footer bottlenecks in the maritime supply chains and this problem with high freight rates? First of all, first of all I would like to indicate that I am I'm not an expert in maritime transport, but we have a lot of experience in regulation and, and competition. So uh, I will present a perspective of a competition agency drawing for a recent experience related to a case of vertical integration or vertical concentration between shipping lines and port infrastructure in Paraguay. 
Well, those who know my country uh, shall know that it's a landlocked country. Uh, so we don't have maritime coast in any ocean. So the question is, why is it important for us to analyze supply chain crisis and high freight rates? Of course, yes. Paraguay has two navigable rivers, uh, which allow us to connect with the oceanic maritime transport network. Um, of course, with the intermediate transshipment terminals in, in Uruguay or, or Argentina, maybe in Brazil too, to follow the, the supply chains in river vessel to reach Paraguayan ports. Uh, and also, uh, most of the, the commercial trade as made by maritime transport. Um, evidently, evidently, the rivers suffer seasonal ups and downs. However, we have sometimes that cycles are very intense where navigability is restricted to a minimum and only certain deep water ports can operate. Remember, rivers. This year especially, uh, we was a strong dry season in Paraguay and the vessel could not reach normal port, added to the problem caused by the pandemic. They have generated an increase, high increase in freight cost uh, for the normal freight cost. In this context, Conacom has received a notification or a request for a concentration analysis for the acquisition of 50% uh, of Puerto San Francisco. This Puerto San Francisco is uh, one of the main ports in Paraguay. Um, who is the buyer? The buyer is uh, a, a, a main global shipping lines, uh, one of the main important shipping lines in global. So also is the most important shipping lines in Paraguay. So we have a vertical integration, shipping lines and port infrastructure. Um, well, Add, added to this, uh, this port, San Francisco, uh, has two ports, one in Asuncion, the capital of the country, uh, and the other in Pilar, which is a deep water port. And uh, they began a construction of a new facility, um, will be in Vigeta, intermediate stage between Asuncion and Pilar. So they will be the only port company in Paraguay that will have infrastructure in these three important geographical and commercial points in the river. In addition, the purchase contract specifies that the, the, the buyer, the liner, and this liner has have the, mar the largest market share in Paraguay, more than 40% of the market share, uh, will, will, will work exclusively with the port of San Francisco for loading and unloading his containers. This point, put a yellow likes in Conacom, uh, and we start to run simulation to see what will happen in the future market with this concentration. Uh, the result of this simulation showed that uh, there will be a risk for a strong dominant position in the port market because uh, 100 of the containers of this liner, uh, they will be used only San Francisco port. Uh, it will be a cover uh, his fixed operating and financial cost just with the container of the, the liners. So they can be lower his final prices to attract other customers, other shipping lines. That will we have uh, that because they, they will have ill capacity with these new facilities. Remember, they have three ports in Paraguay. That means we'll be have a comparative and absolute advantage in prices, logistics, and they will be the only ports company can operate in any river condition in any season. Uh, we have season of drought and flood here in Paraguay, and they with these three facilities have the only ports company can operate in this condition. Well, the acquiring company, the liners, indicate that will we create a cost efficiency because they operating in a single port company. They will be not uh, generate cross margin. Uh, it creates a scope economics and it will generate better prices for its customer. And this means finally improving in efficiency. The simulations made by Conacon in a hypothetical merger between the liners and Puerto San Francisco indicate strong changes in the participation of each port in the market. The simulation was made with the assumption of a concentration occurred very fast 
without any condition or, or specific rule established by the competition authority, means CONACOM. So that will uh, co-lead in a growing dominant position in the port market. That will put a risk the operation for the other competing ports. This could leave only a few ports operator in the future. And could also conclude what San Francisco could finally have the power to set prices on its own, regardless of the competition. Finally, uh, what we will do, Conacon decided to authorize the operation, uh, this vertical concentration, but conditioned uh, that um, for a minimum of three years, since this new uh, facility, the billet infrastructure has been completed, uh, the liner must have to use other ports and not exclusively San Francisco facilities. In addition, the price set cannot be lower than the operating cost, including the new financial cost, avoiding dumping and equalization, the price between M and San Francisco and the liners and, and, and the, the, the competing uh, ports. So that the impact can be gradually, uh, it's, an, it's an impact, okay? But it's gradually and uh, we think not generate big problems in the market. With this condition, um, the other ports and liner have time and opportunities to react and at the same time avoid a, a market shock. Uh, that is of work. This limited action also does not generate uh, big distortions in the market and preserve the efficiency gain it in prices for consumer. Uh, what we will do, Conacon's main object type in this operation is preserve competition in the container freight market in order to avoid possible future crisis to the high concentration in a single port company owned by the principal freight company in Paraguay. Well, thanks again for, for your attention and for the invitation, for ANCTA, the invitation for this other meeting. And I will repeat, I know I'm not expert in, in maritime transport, but I know competition and, and regulation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Eduardo. That was a, a, a story, so I didn't want to interrupt, although we are getting really tight with the time, but I think it's a very interesting case and the considerations you had, how, how to yeah, look at vertical integration and simulate uh, market behavior. Uh, very interesting. Thank you for joining us. Uh, we have three more, three last before then we will open for, for interaction discussion. Um, next one is Jean-Francois Arvis from the World Bank. We are uh, reciprocal, how do you call this? We are, it's a reciprocal game here. Yesterday I was in one of your meetings and you had invited me now return invitation. Thank you Jean-Francois and you have already shared slide growing capacity stress and rates. Jean Francois, you have the floor, you have to unmute. Um, yes, th thank you, Jan. So, on these three slides, uh, are there is data. I think it was interesting to share them. Uh, first, a disclaimer I mean, this is not a position of the World Bank, this is uh, an expert position, and we are in the same situation as Jan. We are trying to pull out uh, ideas to, to see what other. Uh, the policy option, especially the, the long-term policy option, because in the short term, I'll say there's uh, not much to say. So uh, coming back to the, the, the basics of the, of the current crisis, at the core, there is this uh, capacity uh, stress for ships. There are not uh, too many ships stalled. Uh, uh, this has been growing until very recently, about 14% of the ships are, are stalled. And um, given the way the market is operating, this explain also the simply explain the high rate. Also, the, the multiplier is very impressive. But uh, under normal circumstances, an uh, uh, illegal oligopoly like the shipping is operating with the uh, extra idle capacity, and then this is a marginal cost. If there is no idle capacity, the the price are, are fixed by the willingness of shippers to pay for uh, extra extra rates, which depends on their uh, the value of goods per, per container. And uh, we think that the economics is we don't need to to 
to think that there is full place or price fixing to explain this, uh, those high rates. It, it's simply the it's simply the markets and the, the the parallel between the, the what we call the stress indicator based on AIS data and counting the shifts uh, store in the capacity, capacity. and uh, and the yeah. rates are are really uh, are, are, are really is really there. Uh, hopefully, the stress will go down in the coming months, but I think nobody knows whether it will take uh, three months, a year, or a year and a half uh, to go down to normal, and then the, the rates will subside, subside, uh, subside at the same time. What is important is actually there are um, few uh, few choke points, and they are all on the land side. It's not about shipping, it's about congestion of port and internal connectivity. And most of the, the this capacity, global capacity stress, and you have to think globally because this is a, a global industry, uh, is, uh, is is can be tracked first to the U.S., especially the U.S. Uh, U.S. West Coast. And one of the I think it was Alan Murphy made a vivid presentation of what was going on there, and to some extent in Asia. I mean, in Asia, it's COVID related. Uh, so they are brutal closure, yes, uh, yes or no. It's the, their policy in other part of the world when you have COVID cases, you have a much more gradual uh, policy of managing this. It's, uh, it's a way some countries, especially China and Vietnam are operating. I cannot comment on that. Uh, in the US, it's initially it was COVID related, but it appears increasingly a, structure, a structural problem and uh, the productivity and the way the, the poor productivity on the US West Coast has been uh, melting under pressure while everybody else was uh, maintaining productivity or uh, increasing productivity to accommodate more ships is so it's a big is a big question mark we don't have simply we don't have the mandate to look into what is going on and we we don't know what uh, what are the actual uh, actual cause but this is uh, this is extremely uh, this is extremely intriguing so it may be a uh, lack of infrastructure there may be other other cause and uh, this has implications for, for what to do, because given the location of the actual shock points, there is very, very much, uh, very little we can do in the short term. Uh, it, uh, in a sense, most of um, the rest of the world is in the end of the US and uh, more specifically California. And uh, are there a short term fix that they can really regain productivity to address the problem or we have to wait for, for demands to, to come down, of course. Uh, new, in, uh, new infrastructure investment is, has been slated, but it does not solve the problem in the, in the short term. Uh, the typical uh, supply chain connectivity, uh, performance, uh, policy mix, uh, including uh, uh, port, uh, port management investment, trade facilitation does not address the, the crisis, which is a completely different nature. It doesn't mean that trade facilitation has not, uh, has not its own merit, but it doesn't address the issue of uh, uh, we, are, we are speaking of uh, today. Uh, so we have probably to focus on, uh, I think uh, something I need to mention on the, on the short term is that also uh, competition policies uh, may matter uh, negatively if you think of horizontal policy can be, uh, I don't think, we don't think that the, uh, the agency, they can really say, okay, there is a collusion, we need to, uh, uh, target the big shipping lines or some of the stuff. I think someone mentioned a decision in the US. It can be an uninformed decision. At the same time, and the example of Paraguay was fascinating uh, because shipping lines have more money, they are investing and they are investing uh, mostly in vertical integration. So, and there's a, a surge in vertical integration and acquisition by shipping line. And this is raising many uh, issues. Uh, whether they are investing in the inland, inland logistics providers or, or in ports. And this is uh, probably many of um, many competition agencies will have in developing countries will have to look into this in the, in the near future, like the, the example of Paraguay is showing. Uh, on the long term, uh, it's uh, the buzzword is, uh, is resilience. So uh, uh, what the, the and uh, also uh, competition. So resilience, uh, the, the, the crisis has evidence that there is a data issue with simply uh, to create indicators on the, on the rush, uh, to measure things and not to just be dependent on, uh, on rumors or journal, uh, journal news with anecdotal, uh, purely anecdotal evidence. Uh, and uh, data, for instance, data on rates in developing countries is uh, something which is not widely available. I think uh, Jan is working a lot on that. We have to join uh, forces. 
the topic of supply chain resilience is uh, not an obvious topic beyond the, beyond the obvious on infrastructure. I mean, some countries have invested in that and experience is interesting, like uh, I didn't mind Canada, for instance. Uh, but it's not just about recycling. So we need uh, people needs to work, especially international organization, to better define what it is where analy analytically and you measure it, and what are the actual policy that make when uh, when a crisis like this happen make you uh, more more resilient. So there are ma many many question marks. Uh, push for dig digitization is very good. So it's not uh, just uh, the port community system, but it's increasingly end-to-end -end digitalization across uh, uh, across borders. And you have very interesting global initiative like uh, like the trade lines, uh, again, pushed by shipping lines and uh, IT companies. Uh, but it may also raise uh, new issues we are not aware of today. Uh, there's the link with decarbonization, which is uh, which is re relatively uh, relatively important. Uh, but it's also uh, linked with more on how the in regulators, international organizations work with the, the shipping industry. Uh, regulation is a complex topic, uh, and the first thing is there is no global regulator. You have essentially three regulators with market powers: the FMC, uh, Federal Motor Commission in the in the US. EU Commission and the Ministry of Transportation in the uh, in China and other regulators have no market power to really influence things. Unfortunately, with political economy, they maybe not cop. There's no incentive to uh, to cooperate because they have different uh, economic interests and there's also political uh, issues related to trade between those three uh, three groups, which makes the, the dialogue a bit difficult. You have the John Act in the U.S., which was created animosity from the from other, other parties. And, uh, and they have been essentially blind during the, the crisis. So the data is important to make, uh, to make informed decision and some form of cooperation may be facilitated by international organization, maybe uh, uh, may important in the absence of a, of a global uh, regulator. And uh, before saying, okay, we need to have seeds and trust, et cetera, I need simply to have a better economic oversight of the, of the sectors. We have excellent experts, but uh, this is, uh, you don't have, I mean, consolidated the type of knowledge you have for, for other industry. We try to understand the, the cost structure, the marginal, marginal cost, whether the, and, and some of the trend, and this could be very important also for, for developing countries. Uh, last but not least, uh, in terms of uh, long term, actually, it's even medium term priority is the investment incentive for the uh, for the shipping lines. As Jan was mentioning the we are low cycle, and one of the reasons we are in the low cycle is that the, the technology that will be uh, the new standards uh, for uh, carbon free ca emission free uh, shipping are not really uh, entirely agreed today. And this is a, a break to uh, break to investment at the time where we when we need uh, when we need investment. And this is something that uh, essentially is a multilateral uh, multilateral decision. Thank you. Okay, so very it's much, for me, it's a lot uh, yeah. of a uh, lot of blanks. Uh, it's a blank page essentially. <laughs> Thanks a lot, uh, Jean-Francois. I have the feeling uh, either I'm getting less strict with the timing, or maybe the shippers and the industry were more disciplined in their three to five minutes than the analysts and the government. Um, we are okay. I mean, yeah, it's it's a long, heavy session, but it's really amazing all the insights and, and data we get. So really, thanks a lot. I need to apologize to, to Ben, who had to leave in between because uh, I forgot that he had warned me that uh, I needed to give him the floor either before or after five. So Ben, you are, I saw you were back. I, maybe you're now gone again. So there you are, Ben. Um, you were just there for a second. I saw, yeah, that Ben, ben van Scherpenziel, uh, port call optimization. If, uh, uh, sorry again that I. Eduardo, te hago mute a Eduardo. Okay, I've muted Eduardo and Ben, you have to unmute yourself. Thank and you. After, and, and afterwards, apologies, so we will still have afterwards Olaf and last but not least Rodolfo uh, to conclude the, the port, the government perspective. Ben, you have the floor. 
Thank you, Jan, and uh, respecting your timing, I will keep it extra short and uh, brief. The International Task Force uh, Portal Optimization uh, is a group of uh, ports and shipping lines that work together on portal optimization on a global uh, level. And uh, it was be, has been mentioned already before that port efficiency uh, would help to solve issues, not on the short term, but on the long term. And uh, by allowing ships uh, versus to hurry up and wait what we do today and secure their place in the queue of the terminal, it would help if we provide the ships with a sufficient notice regarding the requested time of arrival at the pilot boarding place. So the shippers, the shipping lines, can decide whether it would make sense to change the rotation schedule of the ship, to select a different port, or to optimize the speed and to arrive at the anchorage at an optimized speed. So that notice whether the berth slash terminal will be available when they arrive three, four days uh, away, that would already help to uh, use the ship more in, in a more efficient manner than we do today. However, uh, ports cannot do that alone, uh, nor can the shipping line that do that alone. We need a sort of a global uh, implementation plan how to do this as a sort of guidance from uh, IMO and that is being written as we speak in the IMO full committee, but also a sort of mandate to implement it. So today, uh, ports, for example, uh, port authorities, the, the local harbour master, does not have the mandate to request a private local terminal to share data that would allow him to organize a proper requested time of arrival at the pilot boarding place. So that is what uh, authorities slash governments could do to work together at IMO to have an implementation plan of nautical and operational data for the local port authorities. And uh, last but not least, um, it has been mentioned before that we need uh, port to port standards to share this data, but also from the port to supply chain to the supply chain to have that compatible solution for to translate ship movement into cargo movement and vice versa. So again, Jan, just to keep it extra short, I hope this uh, makes sense. And thank you, thank you very much for inviting me. And thank you for your attention. Thank you. Thank you, Ben, for your patience. And, and really, that's uh, I'm a personal fan of, of the whole concept of port optimization. We had met in our offices with uh, colleagues from marine traffic about the whole data set. And I, it, it doesn't solve the current main high freight rates, but it's definitely one of the longer term and even short term things that is a yeah, relatively low hanging fruit in, in my view these days. Thank you for joining us. So we have two more speakers from the public sector. Uh, Olaf Merck from the OECD ITF. Thank you for joining us and for your patience. Also, you had some other meetings before. And so thank you. You have to unmute. <laughs> Yes, thank you very much, Jan, for, for the invitation. Uh, I think it's an, an excellent initiative, so happy to, uh, to be part of this exchange. Um, so your question was, uh, what can policymakers do? Um, well, I have three areas where I think uh, they could do something. Um, the first is on, uh, on competition um, and uh, scrutiny of, uh, of competition in liner shipping. Of course, liner shipping is uh, a global business uh, with uh, global carriers, uh, global networks, uh, and also a set of global, uh, globally spanning uh, alliances and, and consortia. Um, but the economic uh, oversight is uh, well mostly mostly national and, and at best regional in the case of the of the European Commission. So in a way, there is a gap, uh, I would say, in uh, global scrutiny of the competition of uh, of the business. 
Um, so what could be done? Uh, well, more collaboration, stronger collaboration, uh, of course, between the main competition authorities, so it has already been mentioned, um, uh, but not only the three, uh, US, uh, Europe, uh, China, but, but also other competition authorities. And also uh, maybe to stimulate uh, competition authorities in, uh, well, in developing countries to actually also improve their their knowledge uh, capacity to actually well look at these uh, issues that are also relevant uh, relevant to them. The second issue is related to uh, to vertical integration. Um, of course, this is something that was already going on uh, well before the pandemic. But uh, of course, the uh, the huge uh, profits of, uh, of the liner shipping industry uh, makes it possible to accelerate that strategy, and that's also what we what we have been seeing with a lot of acquisitions uh, of uh, 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 shipping companies into logistics, uh, into um, well, uh, freight forwarders, uh, and also now into uh, freight uh, air freight companies. Um, there are, of course, competition issues that are related to that, but there's also the issue related to the level playing field. So, of course, uh, container shipping in many countries has uh, special treatment or specific regulations uh, that uh, that are under tailor made. Uh, for example, when it comes to competition, when it comes to uh, taxation, uh, and of course, uh, when uh, it is going to compete with other. Uh, industries are, are on uh, on different uh, with different frameworks. Uh, of course, that is uh, that needs to be needs to be uh, looked at. Uh, there needs to be some sort of a, a real fair competition level playing field uh, between the different uh, firms uh, when they compete. And the third um, area uh, that I think is important is, um, let's say, a definition of the strategic value of uh, of maritime transport. And of course. We have seen that, um, especially during the pandemic, how there is, uh, of course, a, a strategic value of that. And a lot of the shippers are, of course, also um, painfully, painfully aware of, of, of that. Um, at the same time, there's also government support that is based on this assumption of, uh, of a strategic value of, uh, of the shipping industry. Uh, I already mentioned special regimes uh, that uh, that exist for the sector, um, and I suppose the challenge for a lot of policymakers is going to uh, to connect the two, so to make sure that there is, uh, if there is a special treatment, if there is government support, to also link that to uh, to certain conditions, for example, uh, a certain service quality uh, that could be could be required from uh, from uh, shipping companies. So these are my, my three points, uh, Jan, I hope this, uh, this helps uh, the discussion. Thank you very much. Very important uh, perspectives. And I also really want to acknowledge ITFs and your personal initiatives uh, to get groups talking to each other when we met in, in Leipzig and in Brussels on different fora to, to uh, yeah, so it was pre-COVID but to go to some of the practical solutions that have been mentioned uh, this afternoon. And so many more years to, to work on this. Last but not least, um, we have with us uh, Rodolfo Sabonche, uh, Secretary General of the Association of Caribbean States and longtime analyst at the Panama Canal Authorities, where we have more than 20 years uh, working together and trying to get uh, more research and thoughts to Latin America, the Caribbean. So in a way, you are last but not least the, the public sector. Also, uh, alphabetically, you ended up in the end, but it's it's the, the Caribbean, the small island states, the developing countries, uh, and you with your background. So what what can you do to solve the maritime supply chain crisis? I cannot hear you. You're not muted, but we do not hear you. We did hear you before, so it did work. Can you hear me? Uh, yeah, now we can hear you. Yeah. Okay. Can I share a screen? Uh, if you can, you can try. That we tried before. <laughs> yeah, we couldn't, so I'll continue. Well, first of all, uh, I'd like to uh, thank Jan for inviting me. And I see a lot of familiar faces 
old friends. Of course, now I am uh, representing a list of Caribbean states. I'd like to begin where Jan started this conversation on the factors that affect freight rates. He mentioned distances, economies of scale, imbalances, type of value of goods, competition, port characteristics. And of course, we now have to add the disruptions that have taken place uh, because of COVID and the pandemic. And uh, I would like to add something that affects a lot of our member states, which is really low demand. We, we have a lot of small island states amongst our members that have low population and low demand. However, and this comes back to the issue of what comes first, the chicken or the egg. Right now, because of the trade uh, war between the US and China, of course, and the need to decarbonize, uh, you know, it was mentioned before that you need to have lower speeds, but also there is a trend towards regionalization. And this is a trend that generates a lot of opportunities in, in the Caribbean because we are definitely closer to the main markets, but we cannot really take advantage of, of, the, of the opportunity unless we have better connectivity. A lot has been said about what can be done or what cannot be done in the short term, but we, 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 we're taking a different view of this. We're taking a longer uh, term view. Uh, we, we need to make sure that we can really provide the supply that we need because it is difficult for the market to push and improve supply in terms of frequency and connectivity to small island states because the demand is not there. So we may need really to start thinking outside of the box and induce some of the supply in some of these areas. And we have thought about the use of something kind of innovative. We have talked with ECLAC about this, and that is the use of regional PPPs to be able to create maritime services. Um, and this is really not, not something that has been done before, but it, it, it will not be as disruptive of the market because right now, and many of these island states are really not getting the right frequencies and services. The, the fact is that by doing it through a PPP, the services would have to be operated by the private sector, but with the right distribution of risks with the public sector. And this is really what is key. We need to emphasize the digital transformation that has to come about in the region to facilitate process flows, both at the port and customs, but also overall in logistics. This is critical not only to eliminate barriers of trade, but also to provide the necessary data for any regional transport PPP system to operate economically. And the idea is to develop short sea shipping services in the form of PAX Roro ferries that will improve intra-regional and connect with international trade routes and the principal hubs that already are in the region. Because right now, because the trade lanes are basically going north or to Europe, the hubs are already established in those routes. We have hubs in Panama, we have hubs in Cartagena, we have hubs in Jamaica, we have hubs in Freeport, Bahamas, and, and hubs in the Dominican Republic. But we need to be able to, to provide the, uh, the connectivity that those hubs give us to the rest of the island states. So we really need to start thinking about, you know, a, a long, longer term maritime transport and logistics strategy for the greater Caribbean, not only for small island states, and I say this because the market will deploy vessels to the main route, but we may have to complement that, that with the, with other services that have to be induced uh, so that the other countries are not left out. So the short term solution may be difficult to find as, as has been mentioned before, but we really need to become more resilient in the longer term to cope with this new world that is essentially is not going to be the same as it was before. Thank you. Thank you very, very much, uh, Rodolfo. So 
of course, it took longer as planned, but not longer than expected. We did plan some reserve in our timing. I, I have to share, we still have uh, 100 people outside the Zoom room. Uh, uh, so it's a really fascinating topic. Very happy that so many people are listening in. Uh, I, I cheated on all the panelists when I invited them by saying, I need three to five minutes of your time. And then only later on, once I had them on the hook, uh, it was a three hour meeting, yeah? <laughs> but I just, so nobody could say no to three to five minutes. And I really, really thank you for, for having joined these, this sharing of experience. And, and I'm, I'm biased, but I, I'm really happy about all the insights and thoughts we get from, got from you. So we now have half an hour left and uh, uh, Frida Youssef, chief of our transport section, uh, who has her birthday today. So we will all sing happy birthday. Uh, no, don't worry, sorry, too late. Um, but Frida, um, you, you have listened to the discussion. You have also followed the chat and the Q&A. Uh, so you will kindly agree to get a discussion going, discussion among the panelists, but also discussion um, like what, what does this mean for us? What, what can we in Angstad now do to support all these different good ideas that, that we heard about? So Frida, happy birthday, you have the floor. Thank you, Jan. I was about to disappear yes. from the screen when you said you're gonna <laughs> sing happy birthday, but <laughs> no, thanks a lot for all the, the, the experts and their intervention, very insightful. And uh, we can see that there is no one separate bullet solution to, to the challenges of, uh, of, of the maritime sector. But um, I will try to, I will not try to summarize because this is uh, Felicity's role and I'm sure she has so much uh, to say on this because many good ideas came out, but maybe just some takeaway messages and link this to the questions that we received. So one, one, uh, one for me, I understand what I could say here from the discussion that there are no short term solutions to tackle the issue. So if there are no so, so solution to, to improve or to build uh, the, a better uh, maritime or to face at least the challenges faced by the maritime sector, what can be the measures then to mitigate the impact? If we cannot find solution to sort the problem, how can we reduce the impact? And more specifically on uh, what our clients are and, and, the, and the developing countries and the most vulnerable ones, including uh, the stakeholders, SMEs. So maybe this is something that I was not able to grasp from this discussion. Uh, we heard some initiative, for example, and Jan, maybe <laughs> not, uh, you know, we discussed about this cap, you know, putting a, a cap uh, uh, on, on freight rates. Is this something, do you think, feasible or not? Should, so, you know, we heard some shipping lines that tried to do something. So I'm just putting it there, but I'm not saying that this is the way forward, but just, uh, you know, something that could be maybe as a short term mitigation, uh, me mitigating measure. Uh, and then uh, on this, uh, we can build and say, okay, what could be the policy maker's role? And we, I also understand that uh, there are two, 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 two sides of, uh, or, or, or two perception of this, like to act or not to act to regulate the market. And uh, at what level should uh, policy make it intervene, or policy maker intervene and when they should intervene. And with this, uh, on this question, there was, uh, I mean, on this comment, there was a question from uh, Louis Paul Tardif, where he says that the policy process is usually associated to a government process. And uh, in this case, shipping lines were not acting to the public interest, but more for their own interest. Hence, there is a role to play for, for governments, but uh, how, how, how they should do this and uh, when they should act to correct the situation uh, and what can, when can we say that this is becoming a systemic issue and there, re, there is a need for intervention? And then the other uh, uh, important point that came out also, and I think everyone agreed on this, uh, is the issue of uh, collaboration, cooperation, you know, and, uh, and we need more for, for to do it and how to do it. Uh, we have heard some uh, good initiative, for example, we should look at it from the regional perspective, maybe, maybe further collaboration at the, at the uh, regional level, or maybe collaboration among uh, competi uh, competition authorities, 
uh, further collaboration in collecting data and forecasts. And here we have uh, heard also uh, maybe an initiative to come up with an entity, dedicated entity for that. Uh, uh, but then the question came about how, if we put a, pl a place, a system to monitor and predict, uh, you know, these uh, type of uh, challenges, uh, how can we do, you know, what can, what shall we do? to prevent a cascading impact, you know? Okay, we put in place the system to monitor, but how can we avoid a cascading impact if the problem is happening in the US now, we're saying, and, but how can we avoid that this program, the problem does not uh, uh, trigger down to, to developing countries? Maybe I will stop here now for these two, three, two questions and then maybe I'll come back to another one that was also asked. Yeah, thank you. Frida, and uh, yeah, basically the idea is that the floor is now open for 15 minutes uh, and I will now go away. If, if the panelists in the Zoom room, if you want to say something, can you please click on the raise hand thing? That's the easiest for me. And uh, I see John Butler already there, number one. Um, and, and then also responses to the uh, questions that, that Frida summarized. Or maybe John wants to respond to, to something that uh, Olaf said, or Olaf wants to respond to something that Alan said. So, so let me see, I have already three, we will probably have time for five or six interventions, because then we really also need to, to wrap up. So John, you're the first, then Achil, and then Alan. John, you have the floor. Thanks, Jan. Um, in, in response to one thing that, that Frida raised, which is this idea of some sort of cap on rates. Um, that's the first time that that's been mentioned today. Um, no one else suggested that, and I think with very good reason. I'd just like to punctuate that there's absolutely no way in a global market that you could ever do that. There's no mechanism for doing it. And secondly, it would cause tremendous disruptions uh, across the market um, with, with, I think, really very troubling impacts for the level of service. So I just feel a responsibility to speak up and say, it's something that people often go to and I, and I appreciate you're raising it actually, but I think we need to recognize that to be quite blunt, it's, it's entirely unworkable. That's my only uh, intervention for this part. Thank you very much. Thank you, John uh, Achille. Yes, thank you, Jan, and thanks for everybody. And I would like to react to Frida, um, to Frida please, that proposal and wish her first uh, a very good birthday uh, by saying that uh, it's really necessary to have, I think, a kind of framework. Uh, we remember uh, before the liberalization of the international maritime trade, uh, we had uh, countries were operating in kind of a conference, maritime conference. Many of them have disappeared, but I think the idea today can just be how to how to redraft the the, the, the scheme, how the thing can be uh, enhanced to better address global competition. It will not be obvious to have a, a global competition authority, but I think if we design a global framework. Maybe under UNTAC, because what UNTAC is doing today, I think, is a beginning of the, this kind of process. So I think if, um, as I read in the, the term of references, if the idea is to go further with a kind of a regional reflection, we should think at how we can uh, come together, maybe in a kind of framework with shipping lines, and look at how we can try to uh, contain the, 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 the evolution of freight rates. Because uh, now, as I highlighted in my presentation, there is uh, the profit is really high. It's not bad because some years, because last year they, they had a, a huge loss. They need to compensate, but the, the profit should not be exaggerated. I think there should be an average, something acceptable. And how can we make sure that the profit they are making is not in the kind of exaggeration. This is just what I'm thinking of. And I think that if we go in a very deep reflection, we can come out with very good idea uh, to tackle the issue. Thank you everybody for listening. 
Thank you, Avil. Then I have next uh, Alan and afterwards uh, James. Thank you. Uh, I, I do find myself in the weird position of constantly over the past decade have been accused of being an unreasonably harsh critic of the shipping lines and suddenly find myself somewhat defending them in the current situation. Um, John already raised the, the, the viability of, of, of forcing basically contracting uh, adults, uh, uh, the uh, rate caps uh, as of a, uh, the reason freight rates are so high is because it's a mechanism of allocation of the capacity that's available. And, and I don't think we can come up with a, a better government uh, forced uh, way of, 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 of determining who should get the available space by, by, by putting caps on, on, on freight rates. Um, that there is, of course, a concern. I, I, I don't believe we have any short term magic solutions, uh, except possibly one thing that the shipping lines are really bad at, and that is communicating. And this could be a good opportunity to communicate better with the with, with the governments, especially here in, in, in the US, on how can, because they have an interest in optimizing the bottom line. They are still corporate entities. Um, how do we make sure that, that the, the long-term viability of the industry is sustained? How, what can, how can the governments and the shipping lines possibly work together, not in, in an adversarial nature, but actually in a cooperative nature in trying to resolve these things right now. Um, we have an issue that the, a lot of empty equipment is not being moved out of the ports, which is clogging them up. Um, at present, shipping lines will move their own boxes out. Um, fortunately, I, I've been a very harsh critic of the shipping alliances, but imagine if we had not four, uh, uh, sorry, three alliances, but. 20 different shipping lines, each moving only their own boxes out. It would have been even more disastrous. But that said, what, what can governments and shipping lines do together to try and resolve some of these, these clogged systems? And I think that's one place where uh, a cooperative nature rather than, a, than an adversarial uh, nature could, could probably be help things a whole lot more. In the longer term, we need to acknowledge that the growth that we've seen into North America, which has knocked down the system, has only been annualized at 10%. A decade ago, we saw growth rates of 15, 20, 25%, and the system didn't break. So the system would have broken in a few years. Uh, it just broke now because of the excess volume. So what, what is it that is, is, is preventing the proper flow of, of, of containers, especially in North America, both in and outbound again? And are there restrictions on it? Are there certain policies that are that are restricting restricting these flows? The availability of, of truckers. Um, we have a problem that that Amazon is offering much better uh, rates for, for for truck drivers than 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 if you're uh, if you're a container trucker. Um, so, what can governments, in cooperation with shipping lines and other parties to the supply chain, actually do to make this flow? in the short term, but also prevent that we're not here next year and the year after and the year after, because 10% growth is all it took to knock down the system. And now it's a supply crisis. 10% um, is not wild, but it was enough to knock down the system. So I think a better foresight and better planning and better cooperation is the way forward. Thank you, Alan. Then uh, James is next. Thank you, Jan. <clears throat> First of all, and this may come as a surprise to some of you, I'm going to agree with John Butler that I can't find many shippers that are uh, wild about the idea of uh, intervention so as to, as to fix rates. I think it's accepted that this is a, a, a private market. Uh, there are role for policymakers, um, but direct intervention in, in that uh, manner um, certainly is, is not something I'm, I'm coming under any pressure for from, from our membership. Um, uh, Jan, um, unfortunately, my chairman, Sean Van Dalt, was unable to join um, the, the conversation, but uh, it's interesting. I asked him what points he would make, and he, he's offered three things, which I don't think really have been mentioned at the moment, but I just put these in very briefly. First of all, we've been talking about shipping rates. Um, in Sean's words, these, this is only literally half the problem. Um, the um, prevalation, pre prevalence of surcharges also co has caused a lot of um, additional uh, woe, especially to exporting nations, um, and especially when uh, they are being charged for um, uh, the cost of storage of containers and an extra handling of containers because of 
uh, the collapse of service uh, uh, levels and so on. So, so that, that's a factor. Um, there's uh, an interesting point he makes, not so much for policymakers in governments, but for policymakers uh, in um, uh, certain uh, corporations, especially where um, uh, corporate social responsibility policies are being developed. Um, in, in his experience and many of his other compatriots, um, there has been a, a lot of pressure coming from large uh, corporate buyers of goods um, that a lot of these additional uh, surcharges and handling charges are picked up by the exporter, the seller of the goods, rather than the buyer or the importer of the goods, despite uh, the agreed contractual terms. Um, interesting insights from, from someone handling um, transactions on a day-to-day -day basis, but uh, there's something there for, I think, for corporate policymakers as well as governments. And finally, one last one from me. I don't think anyone's mentioned the absence of air cargo during this, this pandemic, um, that the, the almost overnight withdrawal of, of, of um, air services at the beginning of, of, of lockdowns uh, took out of the market um, uh, the regular fallback service for many, many shippers. Um, and it put into the sea container market a lot of very high value um, uh, uh, business, which could command and, and um, uh, afford these, these, these much higher rates that we have seen. Um, it's, it's, again, not really, really matter for policymakers, but given everybody else has attempted to diagnose the problems that we've been living through, I thought it was important that we just think uh, uh, that one through as well, because notwithstanding Omicron, um, as international travel starts to open up again, uh, that capacity, uh, particularly as belly hold uh, freight capacity, will start to return to the market. That will be an additional dynamic uh, that, uh, that we need to take account of. Hope that's useful. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot, uh, James, for paraphrasing what uh, Sean, who unfortunately couldn't join. I guess if we had another three hours, you would get another handful of, of good ideas. But overall, I also hope that the majority of key thoughts, aspects, ideas uh, have been captured. Uh, Frida, you said there may have been one or two other aspects in the chat or Q&A. You want to have one, one last round before Felicity will have the fantastic task of summarizing everything in 14 minutes. <laughs> Uh, maybe just to build on uh, this freight freight issues is that uh, we have uh, also a suggestion from Captain Subra uh, Subramanian about if, uh, let's say, freight rates are not uh, 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 the, given the nature of the international nature of freight rates, we cannot cap, uh, you know, or set the cap uh, limit. What about the land side charges? As this fall within the national authorities, if capping uh, this will somehow alleviate the price on imports. So this could be one uh, alternative. Uh, uh, one of the questions was about this regional uh, uh, cooperation and uh, Rodolfo's intervention was also echoed by, uh, by Yaya for saying that this is very much also a concern for Africa so, uh, uh, and, and, and support this uh, initiative. But the question is what could be the common policies that countries could implement to re reduce freight rates again from this public-private uh, uh, vision, looking at the regional context and more specifically in the context of uh, Caribbean Latin America. Excellent, yeah, thanks a lot, uh, Frida. So I would suggest, um, we are, I'm biting my tongue, there are many things one could think and I'm sure <laughs> people could, could go on, but um, as, as agreed, and it's now exactly 5.45, um, Felicity London, a specialized journalist from, from London. And uh, I've, I've really enjoyed your writing over the years, always factual and a, a way of putting things together and not a polemic way. So that's, we thought uh, you could really help us here now to, to get a first go at, at all these different aspects. And then as I had explained at the outset, the idea is that early next year, the whole UNCTA team will, will put this together. Again, before I forget, I would like to invite all invited <clears throat> panelist experts, but also people who are joining to send us additional thoughts, material, because this topic, the supply chain crisis, as was said by several at the beginning, it has had the, the effect that we are in the news. Shipping, ports, maritime is in the news. Our review of maritime transport has never been so much quoted in all over the world or press time, financial times, and so on. Uh, 
So our new Secretary General, the Chair of the UNCTAD Ministerial Conference, Prime Minister of Barbados, quite a few people want us, UNCTAD, to do more in this area. So it's an honest question that we were asking today. It was not to entertain you or to tick off a box. We really want to know what can policymakers do because then this will drive our work program to advise, to research, to organize intergovernmental fora, to help our member states, the policymakers. So that's by way of background. Felicity, you have the floor. Thank you, Jan. I don't know where to begin. <laughs> um, it was interesting this morning listening to the Secretary General. She um, mentioned, I wanted to quote her, she mentioned a recent headline which was supply chain issues will ruin Christmas. Um, but as she said, the reality is a, a lot deeper and more worrying than that because what's at stake is not just a holiday season, but food insecurity, inflation, and a long-term challenge in particular for small island developing states. So I think that's good because countries that are worrying about whether they can get their Christmas presents, it's kind of a bit sad when it's compared with the reality for other areas. Um, right, this is a fantastic afternoon. I'm absolutely overwhelmed. And thank you for your kind words about my writing. Jan, but I fear that this is not going to be as structured as I would like it to be. Um, I've tried to pull out a few key points at least. Um, we'll start with a lot of people talked about collaboration and the need for cooperation. And that ranges from uh, cooperation between exporter, shipper and shipping line in smoothing things through, uh, better forecasting, um, then talking about the port call optimization task force, which again requires people to work together and share information. Um, and then there was the need to talk about the, the need for greater interactivity between the different parties in the supply chain, including government, which was something that James Bookham mentioned. Um, but also he said there's a need to address the inherent suspicion and mistrust that there is in the industry. And I think that's an issue that I hear a lot about is this need for people to trust each other and to share information across the sector. We, we tend, we see, I know from my point of view, I talk to a port or I talk to a shipping line and that there are these silos, perhaps, perhaps not as bad as it might have been in the past, um, but that's not for me to say. Um, um, Andrea talked about, um, again, about the need for industry and governments to work together to resolve the issues. Um, and she said, um, as several people did, that this is not the product of um, just pan the pandemic. It's it's a result of something that's been going on for years, and there's the and the vulnerabilities in the supply chain, and um, the the need. And she mentioned the need of governments and industry to cooperate to find solutions. Um, and I liked her words about the pandemic led to the final disruption. I think that's how she worded it. Um, but of course, when you talk about uh, cooperation and collaboration you also hear that antitrust word in your ear and people worrying about um, um, either working too closely together or too much or not enough competition and consolidation and concerns about that so it was interesting to hear um, Eduardo's perspective about the um, uh, great story from Paraguay about the Riverport operations and what's happening there um, I'd love to know the name of the shipping line, but I suppose he won't tell us. Um, then uh, there was another string I picked up, which was that the policy makers need to be informed. Well, if they're not, not informed by now how important the sector is, then maybe they never will be. <laughs> Who knows? Um, and James mentioned about, uh, he used the phrase connecting the dots, and we need to get governments to think about and update their perspectives on the movement of goods around the world. Um, national transport policy is still developed and administered and delivered in narrow modal silos. Um, but it, it also, again, going back to the sort of silo mentality of the different sectors, we need to understand and policymakers need to understand the dependency of the different modes on each other. Um, because it is the case that if you have one weak link in the chain, then the whole thing falls down, as several people have, have um, mentioned. Um, sorry, bear with me. I'm just going through my notes here. I've got a very complicated colour coding system going on here. So we've talked about the joined up thinking that's required. 
um, interdependency, the rule of the, the rule of the weakest link the system collapses if one is one chain is not up to scratch. Um, there was a lot of talk about obviously digitalization and the flow of information, something that's quite dear to my heart. Um, port community systems, single windows, the need for standardization, and the fact that um, a lot of bottlenecks can be created just because the information isn't flowing through and the forecasts aren't there and people don't know where things are or, or when they will be there. And then there's, um, but also, and I can't remember who mentioned this, but someone mentioned about the need um, not only to have um, single windows, port community systems, but also to work with SMEs to make sure that measures are workable. Um, because, yeah, all very well implementing lots of clever ideas, but maybe good to ask the people who are going to use them. Um, there is the physical, of course. I know it takes a long time to build a port, but as, um, and I'm sorry, is it Chai Chan? Sorry, I don't know how to pronounce your name. Um, you mentioned about all ports need to improve their productivity and efficiency. Um, actually, yeah, um, but I guess that's not so much building. Um, but but he, as you mentioned, not only the land side, but also um, not only just handling the ships, but also in the yard, gate in and out, reducing transit times, more free flow of containers. But of course, that depends on whether the hinterland operations are there to take the containers away. Um, Ashill talked about the competition perspective, um, which, um, sorry, can't read my notes here. Uh, yeah, and he, um, he suggested that um, government shipping lines and trade stakeholders should come together to monitor the setting of shipping rates and address future crises. Now, that's going to go down well in some areas and not in others, I guess. Um, and then um, also they should be taking into account the challenges that the maritime industry is going to face in the future um, in terms of automization and decarbonization. Um, now, let's move on to the trade facilitation agreement. Um, which um, Ashok and Ashil and Andrea and many people raised this, um, and this is something that policymakers should keep high on the agenda, ensuring the implementation of the TFA measures to, in, to ease the flow of cargo. Um, and, and I can't remember, I think it was it Ashok who came up with the figures of who's ratified it, and it's not as many as we would like. So that would be, that TFA is there, so it would be good to see it achieving what it should. Um, and then there was a few people talking about enforcement. Um, now, I'm sorry, I can't remember who was it who mentioned about the, the idea of a fair trade commission, I thought was very interesting. Um, the idea of um, setting up something um, which could consider, I don't know how that would work, but that was one, one suggestion. Um, another concern, and I know I'm out of order here, but um, about the problem that ships shipping lines are with that with all their money spending a lot of money on vertical integration um which might seem efficient in the short term but long term there are concerns about the, the lack of competition that could lead to um as as with um eduardo's um example of course um there was talk about um now, I can't remember who said this one. Sorry, you can put your hand up if you like. Someone, uh, several people mentioned the need for a level playing field, and then it's important to strengthen the frameworks to allow for that. Um, and But that's, of course, how do you get a level playing field? I don't know if you ever can, but we could try. Um, John, at the World Shipping Council, um, yeah, um, enforcement isn't really popular, I think. <laughs> um, I, what did you say? Um, I urge you not to seek to fight the market by aiming regulatory actions at isolated parts of the supply chain, which can only make things worse. Um, um, but, but also, as he pointed out, once you've identified the problems that are the, that are the true operational bottlenecks, um, you should seek to provide additional capacity where it will do the most good. So it's no good building a great new port if you've only got a country lane going to the port. Um, again, better cooperation between modes. I've mentioned that, that came up again. Alan um, Murphy, I can't see Alan still there, is he still there, um, um, mentioned, well, he was keen to argue against intervention. Uh, hi, hi, Alan. Um, and um, so that's, that was another perspective. And if I had more time, I would, um, well, anyway, you can all, you can all follow it later. <laughs> um, I think one 
key message was the fragility of the industry, which was there already. This isn't to do with, well, it is COVID has unveiled it, but it was already there. So that's um, something that's been coming for years. The problems have been there bubbling under the surface. Um, we come to investment. Um, policymakers maybe need to incentivize to invest, incentivize shipping lines and others to invest earlier and more in greener solutions, which could be an important intervention. But equally, where does the finance come from? There need to be some new financial tools available um, to, to help, help um, especially um, smaller and developing states to, to make their investments as required. There's a need to um, protect uh, competition. That is, is that something policymakers can do? That's both horizontally and vertically. Um, and Ashill mentioned um, about the gov governments could can support shippers by laying down soft rules um, for customs valuation. Um, and I'm sorry, I don't have all the details here, but but thank you for those, Ashill. I will go through my shorthand. Um, um, but you discussed about a particular project in Cameroon where the Minister of Finance had lowered transport costs by 80%, I believe, to avoid inflation. I think that's my note there. Um, yes, I've, got, I've, I've now got your name, Chai Chan, by the Fair Trade Commission. I found the note for that. Um, OK, um, I think uh, one that really stands out for me is, that Ash, as Ashok said, um, vaccinate the world. Um, that's something that's pretty key at the moment. And then we get to the end and it's always everything, everything I write always now comes back to decarbonisation and, and of course the cost of it. Um, that's not going to make shipping, light, shipping rates any cheaper. Um, and we need to take into account, I think Stefan said this, we need to take into account decarbonisation for all future planning. Um, that includes who's going to pay and how can the policymakers ensure that the finance is available? Um, and a suggestion, I think, Stefan, you said this, but please say if you didn't, um, that maybe instead of um, spending all their money on vertical integration, shipping lines should spend it on tackling decarbonisation in the future. Um, and that's as far as I've got, but there's a whole lot more on my computer. Is that enough? <laughs> Thank you very, very much, uh, Felicity. I think that was a, a great Great teamwork, uh, Felicity summarizing it for now, and we, we have it recorded and we will go back to the notes and so on. The whole team colleagues in the room and also other colleagues of the branch uh, writing the input, the background note and the review of my time transport, uh, Cecilia and IT colleagues for putting the Zoom together. And of course, the, the panelists uh, whom I said I, I cheated into this meeting by asking them for three to five minutes of their time and now it became uh, three hours uh, for most of you. Uh, really, thank you for your time. Uh, thank you for your taxes. It's your taxes that pay our salary. So we did this whole exercise to spend this time, our time well, because we are asked, and I'm happy that we are asked to work more on this topic in future. We, uh, we have worked on this for many years, trade logistics, transport, trade station. We always thought it was important. It has now been, even more important, it will become more important. Our management thinks it's important. So your input will help us to move in the right direction. Also, hopefully to avoid mistakes or shooting in the wrong direction. There was a wealth of information. I thank you all very, very much. We will do our follow-up report. This meeting has been recorded. We will make the recording available for those who want to listen again. And we will certainly stay in touch. And I really want to thank all the panelists for your time and insights. And, and thank you all very, very much. And a wonderful good, good evening. Thank you all. Thank you very much, uh, Jan. Thank you. Thank you, Jan. Yeah.